integrity, honor, intelligence, strategy, misunderstimation. These are the chief characteristics of the Bush years. It's what we brought to this country. Dignity. So anyway, I'm Thersites the Historian, this is Sean. That was my attempt at a Bush impression, an intro, but I did not put much effort into that one, unfortunately. Anyway, um, let's just jump into this bullshit and get it going. So, Sean, how are things going, man? Uh, it's okay. Uh, just, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, it was another long weekend. Work's been kind of erratic. Uh, we had our first uh, parade since the pandemic really hit America last night. Uh, it was a Halloween parade, so there were a lot of people out for it and a lot of costumes, you know. And it was a pretty good night. It was an, actually no. It was it was a very good night. Actually, it was a very good night, um, including something I haven't done in ages. There was a uh, midnight run to Taco Bell. Oh shit! At one point, huh. I know. Yeah, really. <laughs> actually, uh, coincidentally, <laughs> uh, I went to Taco Bell tonight because we were running short on time after a tour we took. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Once again, sorry for the late start on this, and it's totally my fault. Just poor time management today in general. You know. Well, I mean, I guess it is an unusual start time for us. It's earlier than normal because, I mean, there are a few things to get to with this guy. He oh, did, God, He made a few is. mistakes, I guess you could say. He made mistakes? Yeah, you know, just a couple. <laughs> uh, also, I gotta know, what's this image that you chose for the uh, thumbnail? Uh, I chose the image of him doing the tribal dance. Uh, this is late in his presidency, so it's that time where... Fucking everyone hated him. Yeah. Uh, some delegation from Africa visited, and they did tribal dancing on the lawn. And so George and Laura joined them. And the one really? I really wanted to use was the shoe dodge, but the images of that are all blurry because you know he's moving really fast, and so is the shoe. So I decided instead to go with the tribal dancing, just because I feel like it kind of captures the goofiness of Bush. But also just, like, the sort of nostalgia that people have for Bush a little bit. Like, oh, he wasn't that bad. But as we'll see here, uh, yeah, yeah, he was. He actually was. And somebody already said in the comments that he's worse than Trump. Uh, yeah. Indeed, he is. I, I agree by a mile. He actually got things done. Uh, you know, Trump was Trump was a very, very ineffective president. Has Was predicted by a number of, uh, in, a number of intelligent people, right and left, you know, who weren't gotta get caught up in the hysteria one way or the other no trump. and that's why like my grandma is still convinced that trump did all these things but every time i talk to her i always have to remind her name one thing he accomplished legislatively after march 2017 it's pretty hard because that's when he passed his tax cut and that's also when he got in a couple other little pieces of legislation so yeah trump was kind of a one note guy and then after that it was basically little scandals on twitter but there wasn't much else with bush though Man, god damn, he did a lot. And most of it was terrible. And even the things that weren't that terrible, all of them had shit linings on them. <laughs> instead of silver linings. So, yeah. Um, well, for, this, for this one, I think uh, we can talk a little bit about Bush's background. Uh, one thing I think uh, I want to get into a bit, because that's kind of what I read about, is the, uh, uh, the neoconservative stranglehold that they had over the administration yes. and why in many ways it was, it was kind of always doomed to happen. You know, the way that it, and at least their stranglehold as far as it goes, you know? Right. Um, so yeah. So where you want to, so you want to give that one? Yeah, we can talk about the neocon thing. I was just going to mention, um, I mean, I know some people probably have questions about the Bush dynasty. I feel like all that's documented well enough that we don't really need to go into it much. Uh, just fun side note, the cemetery tour I went on tonight, one of the people buried at Green Lawn Cemetery is actually George W. Bush's great-grandfather, Samuel Prescott Bush. So, the father of Prescott and the grandfather of uh, Bush 41. But, yeah, uh, yeah so that, that was my research for this video. Um, no, anyway... Uh, so, yeah, we all know where Bush came from. Came from money. His family was well-connected. Grandfather was a senator. Father was a president, CIA director, vice president. We all know all this stuff. 
uh, before, I guess while we're talking about the rise of the neoconservative movement, this also corresponds with when Bush was himself coming through politics and starting to be looked at as a serious contender in the future just because of his family name and because of his uh, yeah. relationship with Texas and the oil industry. So they sort of saw him as this guy who's kind of soft-headed and somebody who really doesn't have any ideas of his own, so they can easily attach themselves to him. He, he really enjoys tough talk and cowboy rhetoric. So all they had to do was tone down to Thucydides references and talk about gun smoke, and then they had him. <laughs> Sorry. That was good, man. Um, I think the... Uh, if, if we're going to talk about it in the... Uh, if you want to get into the neoconservative thing, um, it's a topic I've only really had i mean it's something i've only really been reading about in the last few years but we mentioned the reagan video where under reagan you had this entire like you had you had a, a very large tent conservatism if you will people who definitely had strong disagreements with each other are in this tent and they're all united by their anti-communism and if we're if we're considering the way that the American right or conservatism was before and after World War II, it, it, it it's very different in many ways. You know, your pre your pre World War II conservatism was uh, isolationist, uh, vehemently opposed to the welfare state for a variety of reasons. It could sometimes be a little soft on things like anti-Semitism, particularly in the 1930s. That being said, the the right has to almost kind of uh, rewrite itself, if you will, after World War II. And in many ways, it's because who did we fight in World War II? Well, we fought particularly, uh, particularly murderous, aggressive versions of the right. You know, so... There has to be an active thing to distance yourself from that, and plus you'd had the fact that, uh, you know, the the successes of the New Deal, and more importantly of World War II, really enshrined New Deal coalition that they now have to live with. Uh, but at any rate, though, that kind of conservatism was, uh, you know, a big part of that, of course, was the National Review with William F. Buckley. Uh, in many ways, it's aged very poorly. Yeah, in this case... Uh, a lot of their positions in the 50s were like, you know, things that's, uh, that most uh, Republicans today would say that they um, would denounce, such as being, what, uh, for Joseph McCarthy, like being very pro-McCarthy. Uh, this, by the way, I just found a fun fact. They tried to get T.S. Eliot to write for the National Review. Really? Do you know that? No, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. But T.S. Eliot was a, was a conservative, no doubt about that. Um, I mean, one of the greatest poets of all time. But anyway, since it's conservative, and he was especially highly praised by Russell Kirk in his book *The Conservative Mind*, which I'm not a fan of. Um, you know, but I, but anyway, so the attempt to get Eliot to write for the National Review apparently got shot down by Eliot because he did not like Joseph McCarthy. Um, Essentially, seeing him as a kind of, uh, I would say, like a rabble rousing bumpkin, if you will, which is definitely not what T.S. Eliot's interested in. So, they also were, for a variety of reasons, opposed to the civil rights uh, movement. These are the same people who saw Martin Luther King Jr. as a communist pawn. By the time you get to the early 1980s, the Buck and the National Review are starting to shift more towards a neoconservative position. A neoconservatism is rather interesting, especially now that we're at this point. A really good movie to watch about or series is, of course, Power of Nightmares by Adam Curtis. A neoconservatism, I think, would be typified by a few things. Very aggressive foreign policy. So these are the kinds of people who were very much opposed to Kissinger and Nixon with detente of the Soviet Union. So they believe a muscular foreign policy which is there to, of course, defeat the godless communists and then afterwards uh, to try to expand democracy to a benighted world. A kind of, a kind of an attempt to, 
to uh, make the progress of democracy, which to be fair, in the 90s, democracy uh, had an explosion with the fall of various communist regimes, an attempt to extend that even further, of course. Uh, Neoconservatism could go on about values, but ultimately is rather squishy about social values and conservatism. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the neoconservatives and the paleoconservatives uh, they're, they, they, they already had a, a poor relationship that now collapses in the open. These conservative wars, if you will, uh, the degree to which can be argued that there was much to it. I mean, the neoconservatives had a lot of advantages. Uh, they could bring in a lot of funding. They were very good at disciplining their own people. And, you know, be like, you know, neo, and which is also one of the problems with neoconservatism is it's not a very intellectually curious or deep tradition, you know. But they're good. The, the disciplinary stuff makes them effective as a kind of vanguard, if you will, but also uh, means that they, uh, and as we should, as happens in the Bush years, uh, once their ideas fail in practice, they really had nothing else to, back, to go back on, and they did not take criticism very well at all. They did, however, have an optimistic vision of America, which, which if anybody could say anything about paleoconservatives, one of the reasons they didn't really take off, a big part of it is just the lack of optimism. That's the thing I mentioned about Reagan, too, is that that made him unusual was having somebody who's a conservative who's also just very optimistic about the whole thing. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they did have ideas. They're good at propagating these ideas. And they were more... They were better able than the paleoconservatives to play the social conservative game. And by social conservative game, what I mean is, on the one hand, you'll talk about values and you'll do this in such a way to appeal to evangelicals, while at the same time, you're more than willing to sacrifice these ideas under pressure. Um, what neoconservatives, I would say, were most interested in, it was the aggressive foreign policy, the spread of democracy an attempt to at least limit the growth of the welfare state and to privatize it in parts where, where they could, while at the same time having no problems about expanding the state, particularly in terms of surveillance and defense. Hmm. You know, and the reason the neoconservatives, neoconservatives had, I would say, a bit of outsized influence in the Reagan administration, but they still were a bit on the lower rungs overall. Uh, but Pat Buchanan uh, called them, what do you say? They were uh, fleas on the conservative dog. How do you like that, huh? <laughs> yeah. Sounds no, good. I really mean, look, 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 yeah, look, love or hate Pat Buchanan, the guy does have a way with words, all right? Well, I mean, he so, was a speechwriter, so that kind of makes sense. It, uh, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, indeed. But no, no, it, it, yeah, the, the uh, thing with that was. Um, with the, uh, the, the, uh, the, I'm sorry. So anyway, they're in the nineties, they win those wars in, in large part. It's because Buchanan's attempt to usurp Bush in 1992 fails. Then you, of course, you get NAFTA getting, going through at the same time, whatever paleo conservatives were left get purged throughout the nineties, particularly from the national review. So by the time you get to 1999, the conservative movement is, it's weird in that they're very good at disciplining their people and keeping them in line. And they're not intellectually curious, in fact, narrow. But their conservatism is rather squishy outside of the military and foreign policy commitments. And to a somewhat lesser degree, a belief in deregulation, uh, um, privatization, but you still keep the administrative state. Right. I mean, that's more many, like the many, Chamber of Commerce type of uh, politics. The regulation. Um, yeah, yeah. But the neo well, that's the thing with the neoconservatives is that foreign policy is ultimately their big one. Yeah. Right? I mean, in many ways, like, I think that's what Bush did, though. Is not only does he take up the neoconservative banner, but even though those people were fine with the other parts of conservatism, they weren't really pushing it hard. But Bush, every bit as vehemently, if not more so, believed in, like, the Chamber of Commerce deregulation scheme, and also he believed in Jesus. And funneling money to Jesus. Yeah. So, yeah, in many ways, Bush is sort of at the center of all the interest groups in the party. 
And none of those groups are really at odds with each other. They just emphasize different things. But they all kind of believe the same stuff, just with different emphases. The parts of the Republican Party that are at odds have been expelled. You know, which is why... And you keep this in mind, too. Pat Buchanan was opposed to the first Gulf War. You know, fun fact about that. Um, you know, and the next thing, too, is those people are... Eventually, Pat Buchanan and those paleoconservatives will found their own magazine, which is the American Conservative, and it's done explicitly during the Bush years as a counter to the neoconservatives and to and to essentially register a conservative dissent against the Iraq war that's on record, if you will. Like, not simply to say it, but to do something intellectual, you know. Which, but anyway, the point is, is that um, the neoconservatives have purged their own people who disagree with them they have the ideas they are flush with funding they're also considered respectable by uh people on the left especially like the i mean this is a time especially when people want debating partners that's a big deal right yes and sure your neo your neoconservatives they don't have any cultural power but they can be they're socially acceptable if you will they're not going to get jeered out of the out of attending whatever opera you're going to or some Shakespeare play in New York, you know. Uh, so they also have a certain amount of media cachet that most paleoconservatives can only dream of. Although before we go on, I do want to mention uh, getting back to Pat Buchanan. I do want to mention one fun thing. Um, you know Murray Rothbard? No. Uh, Murray Rothbard was a Murray Rothbard's very fascinating man. In many ways, uh, he actually wrote movie reviews in the 70s under like an anonymous name. But anyway, he he was actually a member of Ayn Rand's collective and left that group and had a scathing critique of Ayn Rand. He was a very he was very much uh, like an anarcho capitalist. Um, anyway, uh, Rothbard is kind of funny because considering, you know, Pat Buchanan's like. You know, uh, how should we say, like, ways that he veers into anti-Semitism and the fact that Pat Buchanan is definitely not a libertarian. But Murray Rothbard hated the neoconservatives, Reagan. Actually, if you ever want to read a conservative take down fellow conservatives, it's good stuff. Like his, his essays about Winston Churchill and Ronald Reagan, it's some of the best texts I've ever read in those two men. Huh. Well... You gotta think about this. So Rothbard, this Jewish libertarian, hates the neoconservatives so much that he gave Pat Buchanan a ringing endorsement with, get this, I love this line. With Pat Buchanan as our leader, we shall break the cloak of social democracy. We shall repeal the 20th century. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Rothbard Damn. is very readable as a way with words. I think he's like a nut, but he's one of my favorite nuts to read. You know. Um, yeah, although I mean, I'm sure like uh, some of uh, Pat Rock, uh, Buchanan's biggest fans when they heard "We'll repeal the 20th century," they said, "Man, it should be the campaign slogan. That's perfect." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I just love I, Rothbard. He's, he's, he's a great read. You know. So. Um, so no, the the, the neoconservatives are perfectly. Are perfectly set up, but to be fair, a lot of their biggest names don't have as high a ranking in the Bush administration. And you know, where, as a guy like Dick Cheney is neo is is, of course, Dick Cheney was very favorable with the neoconservatives, right? But yeah. you know, it, it wasn't like he was always hanging around with them. They're going to become useful, of course, once you know certain events happen in Bush's. Uh, administration. So that's some of, just some of my notes on uh, the uh, neoconservative movement. They are at this time fully in power to um, they're fully in place to reap the benefits of their takeover of the intellectual side of conservatism. Well, and, and a lot of the think tanks on foreign policy, at least the right leaning ones. I mean, they uh, pretty much dominated those Rand Corporation yeah. and all the rest. The Cato Institute and once again, a lot wrote about those topics. I mean, yeah, they were pretty much all neocons, at least mostly. And once again, a lot of this, a lot of this also has to do with funding. 
you know, the paleoconservatives didn't get a lot of money because paleoconservatives are, say, you know, bes- this, besides the, the, the smell of racism, they essentially represent like petite bourgeoisie and uh, certain working class concerns, which we know is something that the, uh, the, the people with the money do not care about, you know. Um, so in addition to that, I mean, once again, the wealthy love like cheap labor. They love immigration. So the immigration restrictions are not something they're going to be interested in either, you know. Uh, but but don't worry, the paleoconservatives will play an interesting role and in, in, an interesting and not as well discussed role in Bush's downfall. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, as we then, will see in the second term. Right. And then um, Bush also, of course, inherits the moral majority, sort of got it started under Reagan, really. But uh, you could argue that they kind of went right in the second half of Jimmy Carter's term. Um, so he inherited that. He was a big part of that. He was a former alcoholic. He credits his uh, triumph over alcoholism to Jesus, so he's a born-again Christian. So he really plays up that pretty yeah. hard. He also urged his father to run as a born-again Christian, and basically his father said, what the fuck does that mean? I've always been Christian. I'm going to be <laughs> born again. And he's like, you don't yeah. understand my generation. Us boomers have it figured out, Daddy. you got to get born again. Uh, anyway, so... He plays really hard into that, so that's another big part of his uh, coalition. Apparently, he's really into that kind of stuff, and when he tries to combine neoconservatism with that, that's why there's so much religious rhetoric when he's doing the war on terror. Um, what's the other part of his... Oh, yeah, the, sort of the Chamber of Commerce stuff, so in his time as an oil guy, he was basically in the industry because of his last name and because of his connections to his father. He didn't really know that much about the oil industry, as far as I can tell, but he just had useful connections. So in that case, he was pretty comparable yeah. to Hunter Biden or the Trump sons or some of these other people who have their opportunities because of who daddy is. Um, anyway, so he combines all three of these strands, and I think the ultimate example of the combination of these three things when we get to it, how he administered Iraq once... It, the takeover happens. So from the invasion to the takeover to the planning, I think that you see all of these three factors coming together as one. Mm-hmm. And they merge into what I would call Bushism. Because I think that a lot of the 2000s conservatism, or at least the Republican brand as it existed, is pretty in line with what Bush himself believed. And that's part of my general theory of how the Republican Party works is that the basic thoughts of the party and its ideological alignment will always warp itself around whatever its leader believes. But that's something that we can talk about a little bit as we go on here and then when we go uh, move on to Trump, whenever we get around to that. But I do think there is that pattern, and especially in the conservative, or the Republican it, movement of the last 20 years. Is, it, is, that, is that really that much different with uh, Democrats, I mean, they seem pretty. Um, they mostly say they kind of fall in line too with whoever, whoever the leader is. Well, there's a fall in line mechanic, but I don't know if that means that then they real and they'll defend this person even when they do dumb shit. But I don't know if it changes what they claim or their core beliefs necessarily in the same way. I think there is somewhat of a difference. Now, effectively, I don't know how much the difference makes uh, in terms mm. of its practical effect, but I, I will say that I noticed that. Republican rhetoric shifts pretty wildly, depending on who the leader is. I mean, under Mitt Romney, it, it, the party really started to sound like him right up until he lost. I see what you mean, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. That's what Paul Edward Godfrey would say. Same thing. He's actually, he had, to say, he had a good line about it, I could pull up here. Um, wait, I don't have it handy. But anyway, he was just talking about how, you know, conservatism pretty much became um, a kind of function of the party. And so essentially whatever the party would want, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think you're probably right about that. That's maybe because uh, American conservatism doesn't actually have core values that they're constantly pursuing, if you will. Or at least, like, the political leaders are not. And I, I think, you know, if, if we consider... 
that with the neoconservatives, the ultimate thing is this aggressive foreign policy. That is the core of their belief, right? So a question like, say, abortion, they didn't talk about it too much. And on gay marriage, the neoconservatives were already caving in to being pro-gay marriage in Bush's second term. You know, it wasn't done with a ton of fanfare, but it, it's what was happening. That's yeah, I think they just true. saw how the wind was blowing because they could look at the polls and see that the numbers were trending against them and eventually gay marriage would be acceptable to most people. But, they have, but, but think about the other way, though. They have never, ever abandoned or apologized for Iraq and the Middle East. Nope. Nor will they ever, most likely. So that is their core belief right there. And it's just not much of a social base. I think it was one of the best criticisms I, I've, I've heard about them is that, sure, the neoconservatives had stunning success in the media and print. Uh, and this definitely affected the way things were. But lacking a social base meant that as soon as their ideas started to fail, their influence in the Republican Party waned rather quickly. You know? Uh because they lacked uh, a true social base. The Democratic Party, I think, or the left in general in America, would, I would say, have um, broader commitments and more of them than the neoconservatives. And whatever criticisms I may have of the contemporary left, I do think it does actually have a social base and therefore is more robust, although it has similar weaknesses to neoconservatism, I would say. But anyway... Um, so on that note, do you want to go ahead and launch into the presidency, or do you want to add some more? Um, well, I would like to talk just for a bit about his time as governor of Texas. This is something I've made yeah. videos on before. It's, I'm a little rusty on it, so if you want to learn more about this, look up my older videos on Bush. Some of those, I think, are over on my political channel. Some of them might be here. I can't quite remember, but the point is that as governor of Texas, he was governor from 94 until 2000. He defeated Ann Richards, who gave him a pretty good run for it, but ultimately lost. And, of course, she was the last Democratic governor that Texas has had at this point. Bush, when he came in... I want to, I want to add something about Ann Richards. Oh, yeah. I want to add something really quick about Ann Richards. I remembered seeing, like, a month before the election, there was, like, one of these, like, TV shows, like Dateline or whatever, had a segment on why Ann Richards was so awesome. And the segment totally dismissed Bush and said... And they were like, yeah, you know, I mean, this looks a little closer than most, but she's also making a steamroll. I mean, this is like one of the biggest fluff pieces I remember seeing as a kid, right? Oh, damn. So, no, yeah, no, 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 and, I mean, the media, I mean, a big fluff piece. You would have swore it was DNC propaganda. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I know even years later, after Ann Richards had lost to Bush, and uh, they would still really trot her out as, like, the woman who can tell you the truth about Bush. She went to some conventions, and she would speak about him. She had that famous line that Bush was the kind of guy who was born on third but thought he'd hit a triple and, you know, she really just um, said she had a, he had a silver foot in his mouth. I mean, she had a lot of the famous quotes about Bush early on. But, um, ultimately, Texas was turning red. This is during the period where the South is going Republican. I mean, it's still going on uh, at this time. We're sort of in the end phases by the 90s. So she's operating in a pretty unfavorable environment, and Bush hits a lot of the right notes with the donors and with his own base. And Richards was never like the queen of liberalism or whatever she's made out to be later. Uh, she was pretty much a conservative Democrat. But, you know, it's just one of those things where because she was like the last bastion before Bush and then his successors who were all basically Bush again. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I can understand why, to a certain extent, like basic Democrats would look at Ann Richards and be like, yeah, you know, she is... The ultimate Democrat from Texas. Yeah. Because <laughs> she also hates Bush. And that, uh, it's just like in today's world where somebody on the left or somebody who's in the center or whatever is cool if they understand that Trump is bad. That's kind of how it was in the 2000s. If you understand that Bush is bad, 
then you're good, I guess, automatically. <laughs> um, and that was how it was. So Ann Richards was kind of like a low-key hero for the Democrats all throughout the 2000s. I think she was dead by the time that Bush's popularity hit the basement at the end of his presidency. Otherwise, she would have been on every news show. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. Definitely. But, um, yeah, she was pretty... Uh, I mean, I guess she gave him a pretty good run for it, even though, obviously, as you said, he did upset her. And that, in part, I think, gave him the aura of electability, not just his last name. So as the Republicans were starting the plan after 1996, they said, well, who's had a lot of success recently from a big state, has a lot of, has a name recognition, ties to industry. Hmm. Hmm. Do we know a guy like that? <laughs> so then he was basically recruited to use the Bush name and his Texas oil money. So, yeah. 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 Uh, how was his term as a governor, real quick? Well, a lot of deregulation. Lots of deregulation, actually. Um, and one of the people he made friends with, one of the groups, actually, I guess you could call it, Enron. Oh, yeah. And Ken Lay was a Bush crony early on. Or maybe they weren't best friends, but still he allowed Enron to run rampant. So the Texas Energy Grid was deregulated. So actually, that's why I said back in whatever month it was early this year where people froze to death in Texas, that the Bush body count just got higher. Because that deregulation that allowed companies to charge whatever they wanted based on, quote, market rates and supply and demand, that was all Bush. Before that, there were actually protections on what companies could do when it came to trying to impose sort of limits on utilities. Bush did away with all that mm. shit, and it's never been restored. And that's why there were people who froze to death one, and other people ended up with like $15,000 bills for a couple days of heat. So yeah, um, you can thank Bush for that. Huh. And what's the other thing he did? So he also, he that's when he first really started working in Karl Rove. But at this time, Lee Atwater is, I think, dying or dead. So mid-90s. So his big strategist is Karl Rove. Carl Rove really goes hard oh, yeah, into no, negative Atwater's politics. Dead, yeah, Atwater's gone. But Carl Rove was like the Vader to his Palpatine. He comes along. Even though I don't know if they ever met, but he's, you know, similar tactics. And he's the guy who really teaches Bush how to campaign negatively. So Bush does that pretty effectively. He also passes some other bills in Texas, but the main things are deregulation and tax cuts for the wealthy and for oil companies. Mm hmm. I wonder what he'll do as president. Although, interestingly enough, Bush was anti-interventionist as a candidate. And in his book that he wrote before he ran for president, he talks about that. He wasn't really a big adventurer. He talks about not wanting to go on foreign adventures. So, interestingly enough... Yeah, um, he did. No, he sold himself very president. Somebody keeps asking about... Um, the Washington's farewell address where he talks about avoiding excessive partisanship, foreign entanglements, and all that. If anything, Bush was actually echoing that in his campaign book, which I forget the name of it, even though I read it a while back. Um, but yeah, he was talking about we shouldn't get entangled in things that are messy. And also, we need to be kind to one another. We need to come together. He, he would have a little bit of that rhetoric going on. He'd say, I'm, I'm a tough conservative, but... You know, I'm a, I'm a good guy, and people like me, and I like people. So he kind of had, he was trying to do sort of, and ironically enough, trying to kind of live like a watered-down, dumber version of the farewell address. And then as soon as he became president, actually as soon as really the presidential cycle began and he got into the primaries, he threw all that shit right out the window. Yeah. Because, uh... I mean, I guess we'll get into his primary in a minute, but yeah, it got it got pretty nasty, and it stayed that way for the rest of the cycle. Yeah, that was a that was a that was a nasty primary. They weren't expecting McCain to put up the uh, level of resistance that was there. I can really remember people very actively dismissing McCain, and I I didn't. You know, I was very much like, no, no, this guy he has a he has a uh, uh, he has an appeal for sure. 
you know. Um, but yeah, so a very, very, uh, very uh, nasty uh, primary battle to get him in there. I mean, but I say nasty. I mean, not not nearly as bad as the stuff we've seen since then. Yeah. Right, but at the time, especially considering that 2000 was an era of pretty low engagement, I mean, it is amazing exactly how heated it got. I mean, to the point where Bush was desperate to finish off McCain early, so he went to South Carolina where, uh, because of the Deep South, you have a very stark racial dynamic where it's basically all the white people are Republican, all the black people are Democrats. And, uh, you know, there's not, not a lot of love lost between the two groups either politically or racially. So he goes to the Republican base and spreads a rumor that McCain has a black love child, which for Republicans in South Carolina at that time, you know, it means that McCain is unacceptable. It's a pretty dirty shit. And McCain probably does have, a, yeah. probably did have a love child at some point because he did have a lot of affairs in his earlier years. But because he lived in Arizona, most likely that child would not have been a black kid somewhere in South Carolina. I'm just going to go out on a limb and guess that that's the case. <laughs> not much of a limb there. So then you get into the 2000 election, uh, which we've t spoken about before. Uh, noted for being rather boring, both candidates kind of being in many ways the same. You know. Uh, which is... Interesting too. You really look at it, uh, it. It it brings about from probably understandably so people in the more extremes of both political sides, accusing Gore of running to Bush and Bush running to Gore. If you get what I mean, you know. Um, but uh, you know that that they're um, <coughs> you know rhinos and dinos, if you will. But, of course, Bush uh, will be successful due to the Supreme Court decision. That means that when he gets in as president, there is something of a cloud over his head, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, – I think for sure once he gets in office, Democrats do not really see him as all that legitimate, at least like the hardcore of the base. Yeah. And um, I think it's and not hard to figure out why. I mean, it's pretty clear that Bush pulled strings to get the process – uh, the process of the recount stopped dead in its tracks as it was starting to favor Gore. So there's a possibility if the recount had gone all the way through, Gore would have won. Yeah, Democrats made the major mistake of only the recount in counties that would favor them. Uh, that was a whole... God, that was all just a giant, stupid mess. But Yeah, there's also a really good movie about that, by the way. Um, the, the recount with... Kevin Spacey pretty good. and some others. It's, it goes through the basics of the whole situation, explains it reasonably well. And by the way, the main character who's portrayed by Spacey is Ron Klain, who is now Joe Biden's chief of staff. So I think that because of that fact, the movie now has more relevance because Ron Klain was one of the Democratic point guys when it came to uh, this effort. Mm, so. Gotcha. So now we have... Okay, so... So, all right, so Bush is... Bush is now elected. He has this cloud that's over his head. It's constantly reported at that time that he's just like vacationing, if you will. Yeah, he vacates particularly one third of his presidency between January and September two thousand one is on vacation. Yeah, nothing's going on. The one thing that was played up for Bush pre nine eleven was that people were like, Okay, we know he's not the brightest. Like that was known. No nobody accused him of being the brightest. But they all thought that he had uh, 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 not a team of rivals, but a team of uh, experts with him. That he had chosen some of the most qualified and experienced people in the Republican Party who had major accomplishments behind them. You have Colin Powell, who, of course, formulated the Powell Doctrine, you know, which was essentially America's strategic, um, rough strategic framework until like 2003, as we're going to see. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, who played an important role in the reunification of Germany. Yeah. Dick Cheney, who of course had been heavily involved with his uh, father's administration. It had been sex state. Or was it sex <laughs> deaf? Sex state. No, deaf. He was uh, defense. Yeah, he was defense. Uh, yeah. Donald Rumsfeld, uh, another uh, long time, uh, ch a long time Cheney ally and a very, very experienced Republican. 
and a variety of other positions as well. It just it just appeared to everybody that he that he had simply surrounded himself with the best the Republican Party could offer. There was one telling thing, which I remember the National Review praised at the time. Uh, Bush tried to get John Bro to join his cabinet. Bro turned him down, and then that was it. And what was notable was the was the uh, partisan nature of the Bush cabinet, which is to say, not only did it not have any Democrats, because remember, getting a token person from the other party in your cabinet is a was until recently a, a long American tradition. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just, presidents did that. Bush made a half hearted attempt and then completely dropped it. At the same time, the fact that the, unlike the Reagan administration, this is not a kind of collage of everybody who's involved in the Republican Party, but very much represents uh, the neoconservative way of viewing things. He also, it's worth noting too, John Bro. I mean, he's he'd be like the Joe Manchin of that era. So getting him to be your token Democrat really is not that big of a concession for a Republican administration. That's a good point there as well, yeah. So the administration already appears partisan in that sense. But yeah, one-third spent vacation. He doesn't really do a heck of a lot in the first uh, uh, few months. Um, actually, I've got to say, of all the presidents in my lifetime, he's probably, until 9-11, like, those, those first few months, which is like your prime time to do something, so it's a it's a shockingly lazy presidency in that first little period. No, I mean, you know? like, because the big thing he did, which I think was his main objective, he passed a huge tax cut for the wealthy. Yeah. And so basically what he did, remember we talked about that budget surplus that Clinton was pressured into by the Republicans. So that was Clinton's mm-hmm. only real achievement in the end. And Bush squandered all of it to, ta- to cut taxes for the rich, and then we were back in deficit territory even though the Republicans had been pressuring Democrats for decades over the debt and deficit, or maybe not decades, but certainly throughout the 90s. Um, and then Bush, with a swipe of a pen, blew that right away. And that was his yeah. first achievement. And after also, that, he just seemed to become languid, and he just started going to play golf and fucking around. So that was his main objective. It also should be noted, too, about that about that tax cut. Uh that tax cut in the long term is going to do a lot of damage to trickle-down economics because the people who argued for trickle-down economics in the 80s and 90s could point to a uh, to certain economic – I'm not saying the economic benefits were, could do the tax cut. I'm just saying that they would say, look at these tax cuts, and then the economy was doing pretty well at the same time for most of those years, right? That doesn't happen under Bush. You get a you get a recession early on. It's a small recession, but you still get a recession from the dot com uh, bubble bursting. Yeah. And at the same time, this is really, I mean, this the, we, we talk about the about the widening inequalities, which have been going on since roughly the seventies. But it's in the Bush years where it starts to like become like this giant alligator like mouth. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you know the the, the yeah you know, the, the top of the mouth is the uh, wealth of the 1% or even like lower than that, like the 0.0001% and then the bottom, right? It's the the right. gap starts expanding rapidly. I can vividly remember at this time seeing the price of everything go up and nobody's wages go up and me just being like, this is not going to go well. I, I can remember, I mean, we weren't really in recession territory yet, but people suddenly were, um, they were getting more economically anxious at this time. Yeah. Well, it's also so the fact interesting. tax cut. What's up? Oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say like around. I know around in Columbus, um, there were two major factories here, and even though outsourcing had been ravaging the Midwest for decades, at least a couple decades, uh, it was in 2001 specifically that the two big factories around here moved out, and it basically devastated a couple neighborhoods. That's why I always find it hilarious when people say, "Oh, outsourcing is something Democrats shouldn't talk about. It's just a purely white issue." But the neighborhood it devastated was the black neighborhood, Linden. And that neighborhood is still depressed this day because of those factories moving out. And it's just now really started to recover somewhat in the last five years or so. But for about 15 solid years, that neighborhood was going awfully just because all the jobs that were there were supported by those two factories. And they just went up in smoke because of outsourcing. 
Yeah. And we'll see what I think Bush did no, so this he... time. Not too much else. Enron. Now we get to... The Enron scandal broke. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Enron scandal broke, and Bush was not really able to protect his buddies too much, although he, it looks like the Bush administration did try a little bit. But it was a little bit too obvious to cover up. But it wasn't for lack of trying. Yeah. <laughs> so you that, they, they, now that's a really good documentary. Is Enron the smartest guys in the room? Yeah, one. Yeah, that's a great one. That's really worth watching. But do you want to? Um, although I've heard some of their recent work that those guys did is like really bad. I'm gonna look that up in a sec. Because I think it came out with some other documentary recently that was just like awful, if you will. Um, but anyway, uh, so you want to go ahead and do uh, 9-11? Sure, we can do 9-11, and, and then maybe we can do some Super Chats. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's do some Super Chats. Let's do some Super Chats, do 9-11. I've got a few questions about uh, the war in Afghanistan, uh, just to get your opinion on. Okay. But yeah, let's go ahead and do Super Chats. All right, uh, oh, one last thing. Um, I think deregulation with Bush really started in 2001 also, but kind of on the DL. Now, if stu he continued to work on it for years, but it was really it got its start in that first year or so. Uh, one of the ran two random deregulations that he made, one was CSX, the railroad company. They convinced the Bush administration that they should self-regulate. So now there were no more reg uh, people who went around inspecting railroads, at least way fewer. Um, and so the company itself would do the inspections. Now, railway accidents had always been really low. And they remained pretty low, but they did go from single digits to a few dozen a year of people dying from getting hit by trains. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a weird deregulation to make, and it just shows his commitment to a principle. Like, yeah, fuck it. We, need, we don't need to protect people at railroad crossings. Um, yeah. And then another one is that Clinton, at least I think it was actually passed by Bush Sr., the scrubbers on coal plants, but it had only been implemented by Bill Clinton. And basically, as soon as Bush came into office, he said, you can take that bullshit off. We're not doing that anymore. So he did away with the scrubbers on coal plants. Mm. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I remember, I, remember, I remember you mentioned that one earlier, yeah. That's terrible. Those were also some early Bush moves that I think often get over... really overshadowed both by the tax cut and then by 9-11. But he actually did a few things in 2001 that were also sneaky important. So anyway, 9-11. Um, so I think we talked about this before, but I believe that Bush is culpable for the attack in the sense that he could have stopped it based on the intelligence that he had, and he didn't. Well, getting into this, though, how much does he know? Like, what's the official line on that, if you will? Uh, well, it looks like there were reports delivered to him about um, Saudi nationals being in the U.S. and about them doing flight school and all that kind of stuff. And I think that, from what I understand, neither he nor George Tennant took all this all that seriously. Tennant would have been the guy presenting it to Bush. That's how he saved his job, by the way. George Tennant was a Clinton appointee, but he wanted to keep his job as CIA director so rather than sending a junior officer over to deliver the president's briefing as had been the norm, he instead, as director, went to the White House every week to do the briefing. And Bush is a very personable guy. So that's one of his strengths as a politician is that people like him on a personal level. He's pretty easygoing. And he makes friends easily. George Tennant is like a big, affable-looking guy. He was like a former basketball player, I think. He's, I think, 6'7 or some shit. So anyway, they hit it off. And basically, Bush wanted to keep him around because he liked the guy. So that's how he kept his job. And it turns out George Tennant was really goddamn incompetent. And <laughs> yeah, um, so the, between the two of them, they did not do nearly enough to follow up the intelligence leads that they did, they did have. And Bush was made aware of various parts of the 9-11 plan beforehand, but he didn't connect the dots or take it seriously. He just assumed that things would work out. Because he was very naive, especially early on. Okay. Um, 
I could see uh, I could see that. I remember the general mood was more a blame of Clinton, if you will. But even that was more or less muted. It was uh, more or less people coming together to um, in response to 9-11 with the whole national unity thing, which we talked about in the uh, 9-11 anniversary stream, that uh, short-lived period, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but no, it's the... Um, well, let's go and do the super chats before we get any uh, deeper into this one. Okay, so we'll start out with Dijanese for $20. Thank you, sir. Long time... No shillings, guys. Quick question. I bought the Oxford World's Classic version of Arians and Abyssus and India, or Indica, excuse me. Is this a good buy, Pat, uh, pros and cons? Also, what's y'all's opinions of the Biden cacistocracy so far? And a cacistocracy is a rule of incompetence. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, as far as the Oxford World's Classic version of Arian, interestingly enough, that is one of the few versions of Arian that I don't have. I have the Penguin one that I've had for many years, I have the Loeb, and I also have the recent Landmark translation as well. So I can't speak directly to the Oxford version, but I'm sure that it's just fine. Usually Oxford World's Classics, they're every bit as good as the Penguin translations. They don't have, say, the, um... Actually, if anything, they might be a little bit more scholarly than the Penguins, because it seems like the intros are usually a bit better. Uh, as far as the translations go, they all use pretty well-accepted translations, and pretty much all the translators they pull out for this are legit people. So I would think it's just mm. perfectly fine. Uh, certainly no problem with it. I assign Oxford World Classics and Penguins all the time to classes, and I think that they're perfectly usable. If you're trying to do research, you'd need to upgrade a little bit, but... If you're just reading to build up your knowledge or to, you know, just for your own purposes, I mean, I think that Oxfords and the Penguins are totally great. And they're also affordable and usually easily readable in terms of the print face and all that. You usually get everything in one volume. So, yeah, I think that they're quite good overall. And as far as uh, the Biden cacistocracy... Uh, Well, um, it's not going great. Uh, it looks like that the infrastructure bill has been neutered and most likely will do very little. I don't know. What do you think, Sean? Uh, I have a very... Um, I was actually uh, talking to somebody else earlier about about this today with uh, the Biden administration. Um, and I, I predicted... To be fair, I was kind of getting from the distributors, but I had predicted that about six months in, it was going to look pretty rough for him. It's looking rougher than even I thought. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems right now is we are in a, we, we are having major economic problems right now. Uh, prices are going up, wages are not. Inflation is occurring. The supply chain is fucked. And I... To my knowledge, I do not see anything being done on this front. If anything, I see uh, essentially them being like, oh, don't worry about it. I think that the uh, it, it kind of almost reminds me of what we're going to be talking about with Bush, where you just kind of ignore a problem. And you know, in addition to that, um, you also the fact that the uh, the crime rate is, is going up as well. And once again, we can debate how much Biden could even do with that, but... You know, I, I I like to say that there's a, there's two things that if a government's not doing these things, no matter what, they're they're going to start to be in trouble. And if people are seeing their livelihoods, uh, seeing their standard of living go down, which they are right now, and if you're having a problem maintaining a basic law and order, which uh, could be a I think there's a good chance could be a, a long term trend here. You're going to have major uh, problems with your legitimacy, you know. And furthermore, I mean, uh, I mean, it just appears to be a listless administration. Uh, we know that Biden gets shielded from situations where he might blab too much because we you know that he probably has a tendency to drool or something, you know. And um, yeah, it's not it's not going great. It's it's not going great. It, the one, a few things are to be noted, though. It's not a very leak-heavy White House, and you know the Trump administration is very leaky, for, both because the critics within the White House who don't like Trump, the people in the administration, but at the same time, you also had those people in in the thing who were trying to get at each other, right? So 
that book written by that guy Wolf, uh, Fire and Fury, is essentially a ban and hit piece in many ways. Yeah, so I mean, the I, Trump I, White I House think suffered. in any other era, Wolf would not be taken seriously. But because Democrats were looking for something that says Trump sucks, that one got really played up way more than it should have. Entertaining read in so many ways, though. But that's that. But but the guys like an entertainment. Like that's 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 his job is like following like writing about celebrities, you know what I mean? So no shock there. Yeah, it's pretty uh, trashy. I mean, he's kind of like the Jerry Springer of political political journalist. Yeah, so but you know, it, it, this is so far not a very leaky White House, which I'm not terribly surprised about. Uh, Biden's a very personal man. He has people who are who are genuinely loyal and devoted to him. Of course, they're getting certain largesse and getting wealthy in those regards, too. Definitely corruption. But they also are more personally loyal to him. Biden doesn't manufacture enemies the way that Trump did. And nor does he leave people cold the way Obama did. Because Obama's White House was also very leak-heavy as well. You know, so... Um, so anyway, so what I'm saying is that uh, in that regard, the presidency is quiet. But it also appears to be listless, and I don't know. One can make a case that a lot of its uh, ideological commitments are a bit, uh, how shall we say, uh, out of whack, if you will. You know, uh, I don't know. It, I, 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 I think I, I would say that this is probably seems like a White House that would rather certain problems go away than face them, which, to be fair to them, is sort of a standard American thing nowadays. It's a standard American thing nowadays, and also what got the Roman Republic to collapse. So, you know, always a good strategy. Oh, wonderful strategy. I mean, seriously, Biden, and also the, the COVID stuff too. And once again, a lot of this, I don't want to extend the blame too much on Biden. Like that, that's one thing I would say. Like a lot of the stuff, if I tell some people who are Democrats, this would be like, well, it's not his fault. And I'm actually like, yeah, I actually kind of agree with you on a lot of this stuff. I mean, he inherited on the previous administration. I'm just telling you that over time, it's not going to be seen as Trump's fault, but it's going to be seen as Biden's not doing this to address these things right now. And I am not seeing that kind of leadership. And uh, yeah, so yeah, not looking too good. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up is Thoughtful Pug, one for $5. Thank you. For Sean, any thoughts on Gingrich's Getty, Gettysburg trilogy? I've never read it actually. Uh, uh, thoughtful pug, thanks for the uh, thanks for asking. I've I've never read it. I know the essential out is Meade loses Gettysburg, Grant comes east, um, and I think eventually defeats Lee. Uh, I don't know. It's I've, like I said. I've I've never um, I've never read it, so I don't really have much of an opinion on it. it. Seemed like it might have been a little goofy. Also, there's no way Grant comes east in 1863. You just don't think it was physically possible, or? Well, for one, there, there there was too much of a stink about John Pope, okay? And the, the Army of the Potomac had already shown a tendency for uh, officer, uh, uh, how shall I say, uprisings. I just finished uh, Sears' book on Chancellorsville, where he talks about this. So the officers openly rejected John Pope. Some of them, of course, didn't like McClellan either, especially some of his corps commanders who were forced on him, and they were talking bad about him. There was active intriguing against Burnside and less active intriguing but still general distaste for uh, for Hooker. There was actually an attempt after Chancellorsville to replace Hooker with Meade, and uh, one of the Hooker's corps commanders, uh, Darius Cooch, he, uh, tried, he tried to get him uh, get, get reassigned. Uh, Slocum tried something as well. So... The prickly army of the Potomac was would they would have it would have um, to bring an outsider like Grant in in 1863 at least not likely not likely uh, though what would have happened if Meade loses Gettysburg uh, yeah that's Lee is Lee's invasion is more of a raid and an, and an attempt to win a battle on northern soil. Especially to counterbalance what's going on in at Vicksburg in Port Hudson. I guess it also depends to what extent Lee wins at Gettysburg. It's how much damage he inflicts. 
I mean, I are we talking, are we talking we... like Kanai, or is it just another Civil War battle where the Union loses oh, 15,000 men and gets routed? It's a Civil War battle, so it becoming Kanai is highly unlikely, you know? I mean, you got to be like the Battle of Balin or something uh, in 1808. That's a rare case of a musket battle that is decisive where the cavalry are not that important, you know? But, I mean, literally, I just, I've been reading up on Balin lately, and literally everything falls into place to make it a, a disaster, right? For the French. In this case, what would I say? Uh, Meade could be fired. Probably they would appoint John Fulton Reynolds, although he had already turned him down and advocated for Meade. I don't know of any other corps commander that necessarily would have taken over at that point, though. And that's another reason, too. You know, Even though there was a, Stanton, Halleck, and Lincoln did not like Meade after Gettysburg, which is you know, hilarious because it's like, oh, look, he won this big battle, right? But one of the reasons they never went – one of the reasons they didn't replace him right away was Lincoln Strip said, I don't know of an alternative. And there was also – they also knew that Meade had the confidence of most of the officers in the Army. Right. And in that, and in that regard, Meade was getting rid of at least that headache, you know? So, I mean, with, with a sort of typical <laughs> victory – if Lee had won, would he have had the ability to try to push deeper, uh, try to go into against Washington or Baltimore? Do you think he would just win the battle and then that basically be it? Do, do some raiding, get some shoes and whatever, and then go back. What do you think he does after he wins the battle at Gettysburg? You know what? Let me uh, let me pull up a map here real quick. I'm just going to kind of like ponder it right fast. All right, but. Uh... Because I don't, he's not going to, okay, one thing is for sure, he's not going to D.C. It's too fortified. It's too heavily, too heavily fortified. Um, yeah, D.C. at this point still has like 30,000 troops in its defenses. I mean, I mean, Early makes an attempt in 1864, but the defenses had been stripped to reinforce Grant. Could make a move towards Baltimore. Maryland is pro-Confederate. The only problem with Baltimore is it's relatively close to D.C. and he's kind of a good track. I think they make a move on Harrisburg, probably. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, because I, I, I imagine, like, they win the Battle of Gettysburg, then, yeah, that whole section of, Phil, of Pennsylvania, kind of like the uh, Harrisburg, York, Chambersburg area, I think they kind of hang out there a bit longer and ravage that area more, if you will. Uh, they could make a move on Philadelphia, but I doubt it. You got to get over the river there, which I want to say is a Susquehanna. Is that the river that goes through there? Sounds you know I'm right. talking about it separates Sounds... separates York and Lancaster. I mean, it's not impossible, but then you do put a fairly large river between you and your route of retreat. You know, that 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 is an interesting thing. I'd like to read up more on what Lee was going to do beyond that, but. Yeah, he, 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 it wasn't the Maryland invasion in 1862. In some ways, he had the, he had definite ideas like, we'll bring the war to the North, win a victory, get people to rally to us. And he figured he would have more time to do damage. He did not expect McClellan to march on him as fast as he did. And that's, you know, McClellan in large part does that because of the lost orders. So, anyway, the reason I mention that is I feel like his second invasion, his objectives are more vague. Like, you know, we're just going up north, win a battle, steal some food. Uh, honestly, uh, apparently in terms of uh, resupplying the army, if you will, uh, Lee considered the second invasion to be a success in that regard. Yeah. I mean, somebody said that he could raid for Philly cheesesteaks. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like going What's too far next? east would put him in danger of getting cut off. Yeah. That's why I said I think he'd stick around there because he still have um, multiple routes to get back. He yeah. could make a move on Baltimore, though. He could. And, and, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, Let's get uh, Baltimore right. being very pro-Confederate. Yeah. So I could do some recruiting and whatnot. Um, all right. Uh, next question we have is from... Taco Cruiser for $5. Thank you, sir. 
have you guys noticed how liberal mainstream media tried to rehabilitate Bush's reputation as a way to score political points against Trump? Oh yeah, I did notice, and that, that is one of the things that has most infuriated me over the last five years. I find it insufferable, the idea of propping up Bush just to try to prove that Trump sucks. Uh, it's Well, funny enough, uh, Gottfried kind of uh, predicted that in 2007 with his, uh, his book on the American conservatives, which is about neoconservatives. He said, essentially said that the... The current contemporary Democrats' hatred of neoconservatives was more smoke than anything else, that they had a lot in common, and ultimately they would reconcile with each other. Particularly, one must understand that for the neoconservatives, the rise of Trump is a nightmare to them. This is a version of the right that they thought they had defeated. You know, so only inevitable that they would ally, you know, uh, and also, I mean, furthermore, a lot of the stuff that Bush did, you know, the left's, the Democrats are going to try to do right now, you know, so you know, why not? I mean, you know, I, I mean, under Bush, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the Patriot Act and the creation of the surveillance state we live under, I mean, it was only expanded by Obama and Trump. It's going to be expanded by Biden, too. You know? What are you going to do? Quibble with the man who, uh, who inaugurated the whole thing? Well, I guess that's a good point. I mean, it's kind of hard to critique him at that point if you're just replicating and then arguing in favor of the same exact policies that he implemented. Um, yeah, well, that's also that brilliant thing I was mentioning where, you know, Bush would make sure somebody like Pelosi was there and knew what was going on. That way, uh, they were implicated as well in the policies, like things like torture and whatnot. Yeah. It's it's also funny though with um, the modern neocons now that they're out of the driver's seat of the Republican Party, they do hold conferences. Like there's one for the Bradley Military Fe uh, History Fellowship, and this is still a very well endowed foundation where they not only fly out the winners of that year, but also previous winners can attend too. And not only fly out, stay, and then drink expensive liquor at the expense of the people hosting it. So they got a lot of money if they can do that. And basically it's just a bunch of neoconservatives now bitching about Trump every year and bitching about how they want the Republican Party back. And then one year they invited Victor Davis Hanson, who's a big Trump fan, and it basically devolved into a debate between Republicans over whether the party should be behind Trump or not. And then a lot of the people there are people whose research is only tangentially related to military history and who are actually in no way Republican – so then they're bored as fuck slash outraged, and they just sit in the back and get wasted on expensive liquor. Yeah, I'm not much of a Victor Davis Hanson fan, but I'll, I'll give him uh, I'll give him maybe some props for uh, being willing to disagree with his uh, neoconservative uh, uh, fellow travelers sometimes. But that, yeah, that seems well, to keep him with that guy. I think that guy just likes arguing, you know? Well, that and um, <laughs> uh, one thing I've noticed about him as a scholar, because I'm much more familiar with the scholarship than I am his politics, actually. As I know his politics, but I don't look into it much. When it comes to his uh, Hoplite scholarship, I'm much more familiar. And I have noticed that he has not changed his mind on anything in the last 30 years. And when I say anything, I mean literally anything. Every time he describes hoplite <laughs> warfare, it's an exact reproduction of what he's already said. He will not concede anything to anyone. Even people who largely follow his model of hoplite warfare and just make a few changes here or there and basically praise his model and talk about how great he is, he won't even acknowledge them. Like He just pretends like he's the only person to ever write up at this topic and that what he had to say is the seal on it. Every other scholar I've ever read will respond to other scholars even if it's to disagree. He just ignores all of them including the people who are like 90% in agreement with them. It's the weirdest shit I've ever yeah. seen. But anyway, um, so our next super chat comes to us from Taco Cruiser again for $2. Thank you, Taco. It says, Bush's body count, much, 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 much greater than the Clinton body count. Well, mathematically speaking, I believe you are correct. War does tend to do that. Yeah, ma invading a major country where about a million people are displaced or killed, uh, that's going to be hard to beat for the Clintons. It's raising yeah. the bar way up there. 
And that's not even counting Afghanistan. So, or, um, the war on terror, the other operations that aren't as well publicized, or allowing 9-11 yeah. to happen because you're an idiot. I mean, I'll, there are a lot of things that Bush was racking up the score with. Not to mention um, his energy policies, which is, are still killing people today. So, yeah, I mean, Bush, when it comes to body count, Bush is a tough one to beat. Very. And also there are those phone calls that he famously made with generals where he was saying, like, yeah, 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 we got to kill him. got to kill the terror. How many bodies are we going to stack on this one? we got to kill him. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, man. Yes, yeah, so anyway, um, next up is Nerve and V-Maker for $10. Thank you, sir. And this looks like a Sean question. Why do so many historians act like the North could have fully reconstructed the South and established racial equality if they had only stayed for decades and been more aggressive about it? Uh, probably because of World War II, which is also going to play a big part in the Iraq War. They believe that you know, we had, you know, Germany and Japan had been defeated, and for both of them we occupied and remade their societies in many ways. And now we count them as successful liberal democracies with who are allies with uh, you know a, a, a strong economies right and it's it's in some ways it, it's a, it can kind of remind me of the thing with napoleon where they read they look back to napoleon and read in him some kind of proto dictator when like i said napoleon's more he's looking at the monarchs he's trying to copy him himself trying to try to be like the ultimate enlightened despot if you will and I mean, the, the U.S. Army right after the Civil War demobilizes swiftly. You would have to have, the, 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 for the government to have done that, they would have had to have greatly expanded the military. And they'd have to expand what the military's doing. And this is important to, you know, the opposition to Reconstruction, uh, a lot of it is white supremacist. A lot of it is also based on a fear of government overreach. And those two, of course, can exist together easily, right? But you know, it, it, you know that 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 critique has been forgotten or is seen as just like a, a cover. But I'm like, no, I think that's a genuine critique. Uh, the 19th century America is not one that believes in an administrative state the way that we do. You know, so I think it's a really case of of uh, scholars having their own experience and thinking now, couldn't we have done that beforehand? And I'm like, no, probably not. I mean, I mean, look at Napoleon's attempt to remake Spanish society. I mean, hell, he put a lot of men to that, didn't he? <laughs> you know? Yeah, just a few. <laughs> yeah, because my, my, one of my contentions with Reconstruction is, is that if you had done that, let's say theoretically they, they, they make sure the army has like fifty to 100,000 men, they make sure those soldiers aren't on the frontier fighting the indigenous, which is what most of them are doing, right? But no, they're deployed in the South. Uh, you know, that one, uh, such a fight, uh, I think that the, you might have, you would have gotten an even more violent resistance movement in the South, um, than you already had. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's also, I think it's also like a wishful thinking idea. I mean, people love the, people love the idea of the road not taken, if you will, um, uh, but I think it's just, I mean, yeah, it's wishful thinking considering the, the realities of American governance, um, antipathy towards the use of military power in that regard, and white supremacy, and the rise of scientific racism. As I say, I'm more impressed they even tried it in the first place. And even then, the attempt always smacks to me as also being very partisan and political. That is to say that Reconstruction's at its most popular when the North is at its angriest about how the South has reacted post-war. In particular, they were outraged when they just voted Confederates in and sent them back to Congress like nothing happened. You know? Yeah. Um, so, anyway, there's just a few thoughts there. But yeah, I think that's what it is. They're, they think they think they could have done what they did in Germany and Japan, but much earlier. You know? All right, and final one for now from Taco Cruiser for $5. Thank you, Taco. I think the media is putting too much weight on COVID case rates when judging electoral prospects. Voters don't blame the president for a virus. Um, I disagree. 
I mean, I sure I agree with the part that voters don't blame a president for the virus happening, but they do judge a president based on the case rates, and they perceive a president as ineffective if the case rates continue to go up. Yeah, but also the the everything got oversold. Everybody thought COVID was over in May. It's not. The restrictions are are still. A lot of the restrictions are still in place. You know, um, while being vaccinated, of course, helps you deal with the virus, doesn't mean that you won't get it and, and therefore can, can still spread it to others. Uh, yeah, all that just is just 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 crushed morale, you know, I guess one could have said that um, I guess one could say that uh, a bit of it was oversold, but people were also hopeful I and mean, they thought it was going to be over. Yeah, you know? I mean, part of it was just that. Trump's political inexperience really bit him in the ass on COVID because he over-promised when it came to we're going to get back to normal, this won't disrupt our economy, everything will be fine, and we're working really hard on the cure. Once we get the cure out, everything will go back to normal. And it turns out that's not quite how things played out. So because he kept moving the goalposts some, and then Fauci came out as well and kind of tried to get political as well, eh, it just looked really bad. And it made Trump look weak and ineffectual because he kept making promises and failing to deliver. Well, I mean, we we notice with Trump and we're going to see a lot of this with Bush and we're actually seeing with Biden as well. They do it in different ways because of style, but there is a similar thing with all of them where, um, uh, how do I say, they, uh, it's like power of positive thinking almost. Yeah. Right? Like, and... I, I think they probably might. Maybe if they just said, "Yes, this is going to be hard and tough, and we'll get through this together," that 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 could have worked a lot better, you know. But I, I was, it was a tech this whole thing where it's like, yeah, you know, if I just kind of ignore the problem or downplay it, then it'll downplay itself, you know. And I'm like, no, no, no. When when people cannot afford things they could afford a year ago, you have problems, major problems ahead of you. Yeah. And when I say afford, I'm not talking about TVs. I'm talking about food. Okay. Necessities, exactly. I mean, have you seen how the price of food has gone up right now? Just the price of anything? I don't even go out that much anymore. Everything's too expensive. Or is it getting that way? Yeah. No, prices have gone up. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so, um, yeah. 9 11. So 9 11. <laughs> so in the aftermath, of course, Bush decides that. Well, of course, we figure out that the Taliban was related to Al-Qaeda, so we go to Afghanistan, Bush. When was the Patriot Act passed again? Was that October 2001, or was it November? God, I don't remember off the top of my head. I thought it was passed in 2002. Um, well, it could have been 2002, so maybe it's a little later than I think about it, but it's still pretty early on. It's clearly a direct response to 9-11. But in the meantime, by November 2001, we're fully into Afghanistan. Yes, yes. There had been attempts to uh, to negotiate, but those were kind of underreported. Oh, by the way, October 26th, 2001. And that's what makes the Patriot Act funny. So you're just like, wait, so this massive surveillance bill was just sitting around waiting for an excuse to happen, right? Yeah, it had to be, actually. I mean, there's no other explanation for how it got put together that quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's part of what the neocons wanted to do this when they got into the Bush administration. He wasn't all that interested in doing a lot of their shit early on, but they thought, as long as there's a crisis, we can use it. And then Bush was Never really, uh, you know... Go to waste. Stirred. Yeah, exactly. That That's part of the neocon ideology. Which is interesting because it's pretty much, I think, a part of every ideology that is uh, idealist. Is that you use any crisis to promote your stuff. Yes, very much so. It's effective stuff, though. Patriot Act is still here. It's not going away anytime yeah. soon at all. So every phone conversation you've ever had in the last 20 years is stored on a database somewhere. Every text message you've ever sent. Every email you've ever sent. And Great. no one will ever look at 99% of them because they can't, but they're all being stored electronically to fight terror, as Bush would say. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you never know. I mean... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I forgot. Bush's best line of his presidency, like, not unironically good line. I think he was... He might have still been a candidate at this point, but he was talking, and he had a live mic on. He didn't realize it. And he said, there's so-and-so from New York Times. She's a major league asshole. Yeah, I remember that. That was cool. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was uh, Bush's best non-ironic line. So we're already past the point. We're now on the d- decline slope of the Bush presidency officially. But you know, um, it doesn't it doesn't match Nixon with "I wouldn't give him the sweat off my balls." Yeah, I like that line better. Yeah. It's Nixon though. He's he's better in every way. <laughs> I wouldn't give that man the sweat off my balls. I just. <laughs> Oh man, fucking Nick. So, hey, all right. So, so getting back in with, uh, with of course, uh, Bush. We launched invasion of Afghanistan ostensibly to get Osama bin Laden. We had determined that the Taliban was not negotiating in good faith. Uh, I, 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 I don't think that assessment is actually that far off, to be honest. <laughs> you know, uh, the war is the war in this phase is won rather swiftly. Uh, with shocking speed, I think this is also going to really help with the Iraq war because there was a bit of nervousness about Afghanistan, you know, everybody knowing their reputation, of course, what happened to the Soviets, but but no, it was a rather swift victory for the, in, in that phase, you know. It was by no means a complete victory, as we all know today, but at least the initial part goes over well enough. My question for you is, Bin Laden escapes from Tora Bora, correct? Yes. And that's an operation, by the way, that the U.S. decided to hire local mercenaries to conduct. So while there probably were some U.S. Special Forces guys involved low-key, officially speaking, the operation was conducted by mercs, and they did not get the job done. So we have all these Special Forces units, and at least the official story at this point is that they weren't employed. Well, why the fuck do we have them? But what do I know? My my question that I wonder about... Where somebody asked, somebody said that they gave me the opinion that Bin Laden was allowed to escape. I don't believe that. The, you know, okay, but the, their idea was that this was so militarily incompetent and wasn't the whole point of going there. I I don't know what the point of allowing him to escape would be. And as we all know, the U.S. military's ability to be incompetent, at least in a strategic way, knows no bounds, right? Yeah, especially when it's being directed by George W. Bush and his cronies. Because, I mean, we got to remember another thing about Bush's administration. We talked about how these are all well-respected guys who are considered to be experts. Well, the thing is, one way you can attain that a reputation is just by being around a long time. And that's really where the reputation for most of them came from. I mean, Rumsfeld was a very flawed thinker. One of his ideas is that basically you don't really need ground power that much anymore. That you should just rely on air power and missile strikes. So he's probably yeah. the reason why the U.S. didn't go in harder for Tora Bora. And also, when he was trying to restructure the military, even after the invasion of Iraq, he was trying to make the army lighter. So he was trying to do away with things that would, say, save lives by having armor. While it, yeah. while it also putting us into a war that required constant contact with the enemy and an occupation rather than a war of movement. So Rumsfeld, despite being very experienced, was also, also had a model of understanding for the military that was at odds with what Bush wanted to do with it. And Rumsfeld never adapted his thinking to the new reality. He kept trying to come up with this light, fast, missile, and bomb-led force, even though it was apparent that we were in a war of occupation. Well, when the military goes into Afghanistan, I heard Rumsfeld actually wanted to invade with even fewer forces. The army had to essentially uh, pressure him to get an extra few thousand men, uh, I want to say twenty or 30,000, roughly. Sounds right. Yeah, his uh, other thing was that when Bush wanted to go to Afghanistan, he's like, why? What, what can you blow up that will show up on CNN and make us look good? <laughs> oh God, these people are horrible. No, I mean um, and that's, that's Rumsfeld's. Also, his idea of war is that you have to make sure that it looks good. So he's like, yeah, Iraq would look great. There's all kinds of shit there you can blow up that'll sort of nice fire, and we can just use the footage from the aircraft and put it on CNN, just like in '91 or 1990, and people will eat that shit up. 
A lot of truth in that. Uh, yeah, well, the, yeah, the, the whole televised war thing was so spectacular with uh, the Gulf War. You know, of course they would want that. I mean, shock and awe, right? This Afghanistan, probably the most interesting uh, d things about this is we had won and won quickly at this phase, but we did not consolidate. We were immediately shifting towards going after Iraq, which, of course, we got to get into, giant can of worms that it is. But there is a topic I have uh, of, uh, some interest in that happens the, in 2002, the midterms of 2002. Yes, uh, one of the rare yeah. exceptions to the normal rule for midterms. Well, the Democratic Party now finds itself in a very difficult spot. And this is really the high watermark of, you know, the Democrats being seen as an ineffective party that can't really, that's very bad at fighting for things it ostensibly wants and essentially always being willing to cave, if you will. Um, and the Democrats are in a very difficult spot. They are facing a president with, uh, with crazy high approval ratings. I mean, what are they supposed to do? Like, go after him if you get what I'm trying to say, right? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Uh, at the same time, the Republicans have done this whole unity thing, and that gets abandoned. And, I, I mean, I, it seems like kids play today, but uh, there was a general vibe that the Republicans immediately ditched the unity message in 2002 because they're like, wait, wait, we're politically strong here. We can improve our position. And so there's this entire thing of like, look, if you put Democrats in charge, you're going to be weak on defense, weak on preserving American lives. And we need to we need to have a strong, muscular position. And the Iraq stuff's being discussed, if you will. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the Democrats are not willing to actually give it a full throated critique. You know, they're just not. Uh, so the Democrats go in pretty damn weak on this one. Uh, do you have the stuff for what they're going to gain? And lose? I don't have the numbers, but I can pull them up real fast. Okay. Because I'm also going to pull up one other one real fast here. Uh, the, by I want to compare this. To... Yeah, I mean, by comparison, this is a very odd one. So, let's see, Republicans won two seats in the Senate, and they won eight seats in the House. So, a pretty humdrum election just in terms of pure numbers, but what's very unusual, of course is that the party of the first-term president gained ground. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting one. Have you ever looked at the 1942 House election? 1942? No, I have not. Yeah. Uh, the Republicans make massive gains. It It's one of the close. It's the closest, I think, it's the closest they come in the Roosevelt administration to getting the majority. Hmm. They gain like 47 seats. And you, you see that, you hear that, and you're like, wait, 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 wait. This is right after Pearl Harbor. Well, there's generally, this is also, the election is coming. America has suffered defeat in Pearl Harbor in the Philippines. The only big victory that people know of the time is Midway. The torch landings haven't happened yet. Guadalcanal appears to be essentially an endless quagmire. Uh, we're involved in a war that many Americans didn't even want, really. And there's a general view that the Roosevelt administration had bungled the opening of the conflict. Like, you know, there's another one, too, underreported. The Democrats made a mistake. They decided that they could use being at war to really, like, like really ramp up their very considerable House majority. So they portrayed the Republicans as crypto-fascists who might make a deal with Hitler. Uh... Anyway, that completely fucking blew up in their faces, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, it's kind of interesting to note that for the Republicans, they did a softer version of the 1942 Democratic strategy in 2002, and it worked. You know, uh, gaining eight seats in a midterm for the party that just won the presidency. I know we look at that and go like only eight seats. I'm like, damn, you gained eight seats. I mean, nobody gains seats, right? Right. And I mean, I guess right. to be, before this era, because right now it's the norm is that quite a few seats will change hands. But I guess if we were to go back, say, especially before the nineties then gaining eight seats is actually pretty all right. 
you know, it's something you can definitely be happy with. Even even without the special circumstance of being the party in power that usually loses seats. Yeah. So uh, this is also the era of politics where you had like Republicans going around saying, We're going to be a permanent majority, we're going to hold power forever. One day Democrats will just be some species of freak that gets hunted down by dogs. And yeah. At that point in time, it looked like the Democrats were inept enough that that would come to pass. Yeah, there were a lot of other problems to get into with that. But uh, yeah, no, there's... Um, for the Republicans, the fact that the partisan rhetoric of 2002 had worked their benefit means it's only going to ramp up from there on out. And very soon after, we're going to be in the Iraq War. Yeah. You know, very soon after. Yep, led by slam dunk George Tenet and yep. Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and of course Colin Powell the late Colin Powell who just died this past week. Yeah. And that's one of the few times this past week where Trump once again displayed the value that he had in 2016. His one skill in life is that he can find the flaw with a fellow Republican. <laughs> and uh, he pretty much nailed Colin Powell. He said, this guy really fucked up the Iraq war. Why is the media acting like he's some great loss? And he lied to the UN. They, I guess they never really were that opposed to the Iraq war, were they? But there was always a view that Powell was the better one of the administration. Because, well, as, as Trump actually pointed in his t tweet, Powell was always willing to go against fellow Republicans. Um... There's also a lot of respect for the Powell Doctrine, which I actually think is, should actually in many ways be the United States defense doctrine, really, you know, in terms of strategy. Um, but we scrapped that for the Iraq War. And uh, yeah, so we're going to invade in 2003, shock and awe. Yep. Uh, by this time, of course, uh, Bush's approval rating has fallen in terms of like, um, it's fallen considerably, but it's still high. When I say considerably, I mean, he had a high of like, what was it, 92, 93% at one point? Yeah. By the time he invades Iraq, he's like in the low 60s, um, upper 50s. So it has fallen quite a bit. Um, but still, the bulk of people are for the Iraq War at the time. You know, Saddam Hussein already had this really bad reputation. We had fought him before. A lot of people thought there was unfinished business. Uh, now, I, I, I knew that... I knew that there was no connection with terrorists because, you know, Saddam Hussein was not a man who supported terrorists. That much is very, very clear. Right. And maybe Saddam Hussein represented a uh, part of the Middle East that we've actively been fighting for decades, which is the kind of secularist modernists, modernizers, if you will. That people in the people who are kind of in the uh, tradition of Nasser. Uh, those people we, we've under. I mean, hell, the, the the PLO is kind of in that tradition as well. We've killed and undermined those people so much that essentially in the Islamic world, uh, that's one of the reasons why the fundamentalists can gain power in these countries. So anyway, uh, so we want to go into Iraq because of, uh, why do we want to go to Iraq again? Oil, correct? Oil. Is it oil? Yes, it was oil. Uh, yeah. And also, one, it's funny, one of the plans that they had to agree on before the invasion began is who would get which oil fields. Would they observe the treaties or were they observed the previous claims by oil companies before Saddam Hussein nationalized the fields or not? So they had to figure all that out, and that was really one of the big stumbling blocks before the invasion could get going. Um, oh, also, let's let's talk about the big coalition that Bush put together, the Coalition of the Willing, as he called it. Well, it's like Morocco, Poland, and Spain. Spain and Britain are the big ones, right? And Iceland, too. <laughs> Iceland. I think Iceland sent an Morocco entire platoon. Actually, Morocco, I found out, actually does have a considerable military because of um, rivalry with Algeria. <laughs> you know, oh, I don't I know how know many that. men they sent in. Yeah, no, those, those two countries spent a lot of money on defense, you know. But anyway, the three main ones are, of course, Britain, Spain, and Poland. Yeah, uh, and really, Britain is the only one that had a considerable presence in the invasion proper. Yeah, yeah. Well, Spain did Tony some Blair occupation. Bush got off. What's up? Spain, uh, this, I think Spain had a battalion or two. They did occupation, but... 
uh, duties. They had, they had a little more than a battalion or two. The third one would be the Poles, which the Polish military is good, though. Yeah. You know, so. Um, but anyway, yeah, so they, they, they have a, they have a co- and, you know, they're, they're trying to recreate the first Gulf War of this massive coalition. And yeah, even Afghanistan, you know, that's a massive coalition of forces that goes in there. Uh, that doesn't happen. There's a whole lot of reasons for that. Uh, the French rightfully thought it was going to be a quagmire. Uh, at the time, there were accusations that France and Germany had economic ties to Iraq, which I'm pretty sure they did. But neither country thought much good was going to come out of it. Or I think Italy might have sent troops in, too, although very, very few. But anyway. Um, and that's when uh, yeah, we, so we demonized the, the French and tried to create Freedom Prize because the French opposed the war. Yeah. They didn't want to participate in our stupid-ass war, so we had to talk shit about them for a few years. Yeah. So, anyway, uh... So... Bush... He's a, it's, it's a major... It's a major blunder in so far as he severely frays relations with a variety of European countries. Uh, an argument to be made that, for some of them... Their, some of their disagreements were less about the actual invasion and more having to do with America at this time pretty much acting like, look, you're just going to go along with us, you know, uh, which is in keeping with Bush, too. Uh, personality wise, he was noted for uh, you, still, you talked about being affable. He also had a reputation as a bully, too. You know, when he wanted to be notorious for making up nicknames for people. My favorite one, of course, being John Boehner. He's Boner. Oh, well, that, that one's a little obvious, but a uh, turd blossom is Carl Rove. <laughs> yeah, so we don't invade Iraq with enough men. We get rid of a lot of the Bathist Party almost right away. Yep. Uh, so these unemployed people who were the favorites of Saddam Hussein are going to form the first part of the insurgency. Yep. And uh, all the military Naturally, was disbanded course, all at once, so thousands, hundreds, like over 100,000 men are immediately unemployed and basically cut off from any source of employment. Yeah. And uh, also all the state industries are immediately tossed out and disbanded because of the shock doctrine. Because of the shock doctrine. Oh, one that, one that, you'll all, one that you and your audience will love, they, they didn't have, U.S. troops were not detailed to defend the Baghdad Museum, which means a lot of it's... Uh, treasures, you know, things from the, um, you know, going all the way back to Sumeria are looted yep. during the invasion. They sure were. Uh, that was a, one of the many major fuck-ups. I mean, yeah, what else do they do in this invasion? Oh, yeah, so the contracts they do give out early in the war and for a long time, the major contracts are offered to, of course, American companies. So that's where the money's going to rebuild Iraq. And then the subcontracts also pretty much all go to Americans. So if you're an Iraqi, you can't even get a job rebuilding your own fucking country. At least not a job that pays anything. And if you do get one, then you're basically a subcontractor to a subcontractor. Yeah. So it's a real shit show. And we also didn't think about the fact that we invaded in a balkanized country, did we? You know, with the three main factions being Shiite, Sunni, and... And Kurds, and the only group that fully backed us was the Kurds, right. which are also in the part of Iraq that has the least economic value. Yeah, so they're the third most powerful group in this tripartite state. Um, but also, another thing to keep in mind is that military genius and expert at strategy, Donald Rumsfeld, famously said that the difference between Sunni and Shia is irrelevant and wouldn't be a problem. Spoken like a true neoconservative or, you know, deracinated Americans, if you will. You know, we have this, we, we don't under, you know, a failure to understand the importance of culture, region, and religion, right? Yeah, because every fucking everybody... Middle Eastern expert ever told him this. And would, every time somebody would come in and brief the cabinet, they'd say, look, this is going to be a huge problem. These two groups don't like each other, and many of the Shiites in the South would rather be a part of Iran. And Rumsfeld's like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. I had to deal with the Russians during the Cold War. I know what I'm talking about. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And he convinced oh, Bush God, that it wouldn't I be mean, a problem. This, I mean, yeah, this is so, this is, this is so goddamn obvious, too, because 
we have this. It's like his view. You know, it's, it's like that line in Full Metal Jacket where he says that uh, inside of every Vietnamese is an American waiting to get out. Huh. When he's talking, he's talking to the general who uh, he's pissed down because he has the peace symbol on, and uh, he's got lines like, you know, like you will tell me what's up, or I will take a giant shit on you. And he's just, yeah, he gets some great lines, but he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, I believe inside every Vietnamese there's a decent American, <laughs> you know. And it's this idea that once we would invade, and you can call this liberal universalism, if you will, uh, that they're all just liberals at heart, and they'll go right into that. You know, they'll all start becoming consumers and liberals almost right away. You know, these uh, the, the, these other views and beliefs uh, that we're ignoring, it's because you know, that's not what they really are, right? And this whole idea of like, oh, well, you know, like I dealt with the Soviets, what do you know? It's like, well, you know, Soviets in many ways, uh, you know, came apart for reasons like that, having to do with ethnic groups and religion as well. You know, it's, it's God, what a fucking idiot, man. Uh, now, Rumsfeld, so, yeah, yeah. it's amazing to me, honestly, because normally if you want someone to carry out a specific plan, especially one that's ideologically charged, you want somebody who believes in it to be your executioner. I honestly believe someone who was diametrically opposed to Rumsfeld but forced to be a neocon sect def would have still been more competent. Ralph Nader, if forced to take up the views of Rumsfeld, could have done a much better job executing or running the Department of Defense at that time. Even if he had yeah. been forced to take the neoconservative line and was resisting 100% of the way and storming out of cabinet meetings and causing all kinds of havoc, he'd have still been way more effective than Rumsfeld. Just because Rumsfeld is so fucking impervious to new information. He will not listen to anyone else's opinion. I, I should say he, well, he wouldn't because he's dead now. But uh, yeah, this is a man who always thought he was right, especially when he had no evidence or reason to think that what he was saying was accurate. Hmm. God, this idea that they're all just little Americans waiting to blossom, right? It's yeah. So fucking stupid. No, it is. And it's amazing yeah. to me that these were supposed to be the smartest guys in the room. Cause I think this is really a part of, uh, the revelation, especially the last 20 years, where I think a lot of people have why have wise up to the fact that just having the most credentials on paper does not mean that you're a, a genius or that your expertise will translate to success. I think really the Bush administration is kind of what started to wake me up to that. Just looking at the credentials versus the results. Yeah, definitely. I could that same thing with me. Uh, yep. Yeah. So we all think they're all these little Americans are going to blossom out of nowhere. They don't. You're you, the thing you said about the contractors. I didn't know about that, but that's very true. You can't even help. You're not even allowed to be involved in the rebuilding of your country. At that point, you know that it's a large part of money-making venture. Oh, it is. Uh, and you know who you, oh, you know who's in charge of this whole operation? It was a guy named uh, F. Paul Bremer, who was just some random neocon oh, businessman. I mean, he was not somebody who was really an expert on the Middle East. Or well, he didn't have any ties to the region. He wasn't half Iraqi or something. I don't, I don't know if you knew anything about Islam. I mean, why the fuck did they send him? Oh, because well, that's right, he's pro-corporate. That's why he got sent. He would make sure the oil contractors got paid. Or the oil companies got paid, yeah. I should say. We'll get into a bit of that when we get to Katrina in a minute, right? Uh, with something like that. Um, <laughs> but no, the... Uh, I the, the strategic... I mean, we should probably do an Iraq war thing sometime, just on its own. You know, I can read into some more details about it, but just the pure strategic failure of the whole thing. I I was thinking at the time, I was uh, reading uh, Caesar's Gallic War, and I was thinking, if you were going to be successful in Iraq, you'd probably have to do something like what he did. And something that I want to say, too, about the about the liberal thing as well. You know, say we will against, for against the Persian, Roman, and British empires. None of them were stupid enough to think the people that they were in conquering, like we did in Iraq, were just like little Romans or little Britons just waiting to come out. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you're right about that. I mean, and uh, it's also interesting because even the empires that weren't, uh, that didn't engage in practices as brutal as what Caesar did in Gaul, even the Persians, who were relatively gentle as far as empires go, 
They did sometimes use the population relocation technique to deal with difficult people, to divide them and make sure that they weren't concentrated in an area where they could really cause problems. So, I mean, if you're really going to yeah. try to conquer people and make them submit and then accept your values, which the Romans were better at than most other ancient conquerors, uh, you have to engage in some form of coercion. You either have to cut them off and isolate them, or you have to forcibly convert them by making sure that the only way you can get the benefits is by adhering culturally. I mean, that's what the Greeks did after Alexander. They didn't force people to adopt their culture, but basically if you wanted to be a government official, you had to learn Greek. And then if you're going to do that, then you might as well do all the other stuff Greeks do. So they sort of created this incentive structure. But early Greek colonists, before that even, when they were operating on a much smaller scale in the Archaic period, there was a tradition that what they would do when they were colonizing an area is mostly the men would go out as colonists and then they needed wives, but they didn't want their sons and daughters to speak some bullshit language that they didn't believe in. So they would cut out the tongues of these women that they would take captive and then make those women their wives and have babies by them. So, I mean, the, like all these colonizers in the past have always been brutal. And they have not been idealist in this way. Like, yeah, we're just going to go there. We're going to build a McDonald's. And people say, man, we've been missing out. Let's become Americans. Let's learn to speak English and, uh, you know, join the Ruritan Club. You still there? Oh, shit. Sean? Uh, looks like uh, Sean's audio is having an issue here. Um, let me send him a text real fast. Okay, my phone's barely functioning. Damn it. Sorry about this, guys. Um, Motor, good, good uh, name there. Shit. So it looks like... Okay, so I guess he had to log out, and he'll be back in a second, hopefully. So what I could do is I will go ahead and do one of the Super Chats while we're waiting for Sean to return. So Modern Guru for $10 says, thank you, sir. I apologize for missing your last two shows. I read a couple of VDH books, enjoyed them. He's not super neocon like Crystal or Krauthammer. He just gets goofy with his USA Ancient Greek comparisons. Well, I mean, obviously he's a lot smarter than Crystal or Krauthammer. But I think that the problems do go deeper than his attempts at ham-fisted comparisons. I mean, one of, the, one of the problems with the comparisons that you mentioned is that he always talks about the Greek middle class, which was not a thing. There really was no meaningful middle class in antiquity. There, were, there might have been a handful of people who might fit that bill, but for the most part, you had workers, skilled workers, who were still pretty firmly working class. Uh, and by workers, mostly I mean people who owned small farms, subsistence farmers. You also had a huge amount of slaves as well. Never forget that. And then you have your upper class. And among the upper class, there's some variants, but basically your upper class, if you don't have to work for a living, if all your... Uh, Expenses are taken care of by passive revenue. So, like, Socrates was upper class in the sense he didn't have to work, but he's, like, at the bare minimum of that, where someone like uh, Nicias owns a thousand slaves and has a factory. And there's a big difference between the two of them uh, in that regard. Uh, but, yeah, I think with Victor Davis Hanson, he does have some serious issues, and that is one of them, is that he makes overwrought comparisons the other issue, of course, is that um, he is unwilling to admit that he might be wrong about something. So one example of this is that one of his contentions in his early work is that when the hoplite lines would crash into each other, the first and second line were basically annihilated. But there's no way that's possibly true. Because we have lots of testimony about men who fought in the first line of a battle one year, and the next year they're in the Olympics. So he's way off about casualties and about the idea that the front ranks were basically doomed because they would collide into each other. There's also no evidence that they would always run as a rule. 
In fact, uh, most people now think that this was the exception, and that's why it got emphasized so much at Marathon, because it was an odd thing they chose to do. So, in many ways, yeah, that's another Davis Hanson problem, is that he massively exaggerates the influence of Marathon, and sees that as sort of the only model for a hoplite battle. But yeah, anyway, um, so Victor Davis Hanson has a lot of issues, and I will have to say, I do have to say he is uh, better at history than he is at politics. I read a little bit of Californication, and that is embarrassing to say the least. So next super chat comes from Mo Tur for five dollars. Uh, thank you, sir. There were, I don't think there was a message there, but I'll check again just to make double sure. All right. Well, thank you for the dono. Uh, let's see. Merchant says the middle class. Uh, sort of. I mean, but once again, though, if they're if they're working actively then they're probably not quite in the middle. Uh, I mean, maybe. Maybe merchants would count. I don't know. I guess it depends on how prosperous you are. I mean, some of the major merchants are definitely upper class. Because if you can finance a ship by yourself, in that case, you have to be pretty loaded. But then also, there is um, the, uh, the issue of how things can be financed by multiple people. So you can get stuff financed if you're not super wealthy by going in with a group of people who invest in a grain shipment or a ship with pottery because you, you want to spread that risk around. Otherwise, you will be in deep, deep shit if the ship goes down, which it very well can in ancient Greece because, well, shipping technology being what it was... That happened quite a bit, and if you invested really heavily in a single ship, then you had a very good chance of going broke. So usually risk would be divided. All right. Uh, Diogenes for $5 asked, what would have made Americanization possible in Iraq? Also, what would be a good assimilation policy, seeing as we struggle with this here? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think anything would have made it possible. Now, one thing that would have made a democracy more possible is you have to get the level of uh, income up. Because normally a democracy only really sticks when people are making over $3,500 a year. At least that was the figure as it stood in the mid-2000s when we are trying to actually do this in Iraq. And the Iraqi income, I don't know what it was at, but it was below that. And that was kind of a problem for people who were trying to democratize the country. Another thing that we'd have had to do in order to make it more Americanized would be to create a local government that was balanced between the groups in Iraq, so that way they all have their rights protected in some way, and put uh, structures in place that would prevent any kind of uh, oppression based on religion. So yeah, that would have to be a factor in that for sure. In terms of a good assimilation policy, I don't know if Iraq was really set up for assimilation. I feel like it was naturally set up to be divided into three parts, just because that's how it was set up by the British. And I don't think those three groups wanted to come together to form a new identity. I just don't get that impression. It's possible that over time, because of their shared Sunni heritage, the Sunnis who had followed Saddam and then the Kurds might have found common cause against the Shiite majority... But for the most part, I don't think that there was ever going to be an assimilation into an Iraqi identity, just because it is a made-up artificial identity to begin with, and because any American intervention in the area would not really do anything to alter that fact. Sean, are you there? Okay, I think Sean is back, but I can only really hear his cabinets. Hey, hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. So you're back. Looks like I'm back. All right. Sorry. Don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, just some uh, internet hiccups, I guess, down in New Orleans. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah. 
it's going in and out for me right now. Um. Yeah, I, I. So I guess we'll have to work around that as best we can. Um, so we were talking about F. Paul Brimmer when you cut out and Bush's yeah, no, plan. A terrible choice. I mean, there is a mix with Iraq where it's to make certain corporations wealthy, that's for sure. There is an idea of we're going to spread democracy and Americanism. Um, and once again, you know, not doing what other people would have done with incentives, but also just assuming that they're just good little Americans waiting to blossom up, right? Uh, also, you know, almost a way to one-up his father. Like, look, I finished what you should have done, you know? Because <laughs> I know... I know the uh, Bush and his dad have a tense, odd relationship, you know? At least they did at the time. I think as they got older post-presidency, they got closer. But, um, yeah, I mean, they Thanks. definitely had a bit of a rivalry, especially at that period. And it was it's well known that Bush Sr. was pretty upset with what his son was doing, but he wouldn't say anything about it. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, there, there is that going on, I think, psychologically. But mostly it's that the people who followed Bush Sr. now had no one at the top to tell them, no, that's a bad idea. And because, <laughs> because Bush Sr. would not speak out because he didn't want to overstep with his son, there was no adult in the room anymore. And this was all just a bunch of ideological extremists in a room together with excessively rosy pictures of what was possible. And yeah, that's why we had got to where we're at. Yeah. The other thing too is going on as well is, um, the American right goes real crazy at this time, you know, American flag pins everywhere. And I was telling you early about, you know, neoconservatives and their ability to maintain discipline. That gets really bad in the Bush years. Um, if you're stepping out of line in any kind of regard, you can essentially be excommunicated from the faith, if you will. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is around the time that I kind of saw the Republican Party, like, you know, for lack of a way to put it, kind of just lose their sense of humor, if you will. Yeah. Whatever flexibility or broadness was there was becoming much more narrow. What it meant to actually be a Republican was becoming very specific. Um, to the point where you had uh, like Ronald Reagan, right? And you'd look at the stuff he did, and it's like, there's no way this would fly right now. Like, Reagan would be considered a heretic for some of the shit he did, you know? Yeah, that's why I don't Especially, mention it. He's just, yeah, exactly. He's just Saint Ronald. Of course, remember, remember, when Reagan, remember when Reagan died during the Bush administration? They got that massive funeral for him. Remember that? I do. Yeah, I remember that happening and um, really because I feel like Reagan was already being worshipped, but then I feel like the worship took on a new level for about a solid decade where it was the party of Lincoln and Reagan. Mm-hmm. And then I remember the 2012 primary, literally, as, because at this point, Bush was long discredited. The 2012 primary, and to a certain extent, the 2016 primary, Many of the questions were basically, which one of you is the most like Reagan? <laughs> oh, yeah. We did a compilation video one time of them saying taxes and Reagan. Like, how many times it was said. Yeah. One of those debates, it was hilarious. And of course, it just sounds like tax Reagan. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, I remember that coming up an excessive amount. The, the 2012 Republican primary debates were pretty boring just because everybody was trying to claim the mantle of Reagan. Except for that one part of one of those debates where Ron Paul was talking about you can't build a wall because otherwise it'll be used to hold us in and trap us into like some sort of prison. And for some reason, that clip never went viral. That was the only interesting thing that happened in that entire debate. And escape from New York a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe he had watched a lot of Escape from New York. Maybe uh, Ron Paul's a John Carpenter fan. I don't know. But uh, any... but no. Oh, do it. No, man. It was like um. We can go on and on about the strategic buffoonery here. On my end, I knew the war was lost, 
when Bush would acknowledge there was actually an insurrection happening when one obviously was. Um, and, you know, just the amount of, like, I mean, one, the, one another thing was a tacit admission that nobody wants to be in this fucking war was, remember Fallujah? Yeah. Remember how the assault on Fallujah conveniently happened the day after he wins the election? I mean, what, those troops just sitting around being like, we gotta wait for the president? To yeah. get reelected before we attack. Yeah. Well, also even or, before you know. that, um, let's see what was another thing that happened. Oh yeah, the mission accomplished banner. Remember that one? Oh god, yeah, yeah. So it was early that 2004. Got as, that got defended as the mission accomplished banner was for the carrier, not for the thing. But no, I mean, he flies in a jet and he's like, "Major combat is over." I mean, he is definitely saying that um, you know we have won the day. Um, yeah, it was just oh god, it was fucking terrible, man. It, yeah. <sighs> what buffoon, but fucking buffoonery, man. Sorry, just you know it was it, 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 it was pathetic. Uh, I think I mean, how many Iraqis died in this fucking war too? How many? Uh, I think it's an estimate. Well, it's an estimate because we don't know the exact number. The estimates are about a million in total. So, God, what a waste! I know it is a complete waste. Um, Hundreds of thousands dislocated. Uh, yeah, a complete tragedy. Well, I guess not a tragedy since this was avoidable. But, yeah, just a fucking nightmare. The last way too long. Should have never happened in the first place. Um, More evil than a war of choice. We didn't have to go. A war of choice that also had no point. I mean, it would be one thing if, like, you could make a solid case that we can prevent the rise of the next Hitler by some alchemy that we've developed if we only go into this country and do a regime change war. So it's no, not as if they, access. Yeah, there was an axis of evil speech that early on. So he named Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. And then, um, guess what? Iran got angry about that when they saw us invade the two countries on either side of them they got alarmed and so there's a <laughs> very 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 high chance that they might have helped out the Shiite insurgents in Iraq and by very high oh, chance I'm certain. saying they yeah. fucking did it uh, well they, 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 they're they definitely their regional power in Iran Iran is a regional power uh, their stock rose at that time of course uh, yeah, and another one too that happens, of course, is one of the big ones they'll tout as a success is the fact that Libya gives up whatever minuscule weapons of mass destruction it has and plays along. Mm. Then we got the whole thing where Gaddafi was cool for a minute. Remember that? Yeah. I mean, Gaddafi does look like an '80s rock star, though. God, God, our thing for turning on a dime of this stuff is disgusting. Like, is Gaddafi a horrible person or is he not? Well, I right? think he probably is, given that he's a dictator. Yeah, but, like, he, he he played ball with Bush. They let him, like, set up a fucking tent in Central Park, right? Yeah. And now, you know, oh, Bush ain't so bad. He doesn't like uh, Trump. And besides, he was trying to, do his, trying to do his best job, you know? Yeah, or if you didn't, just, if you, even if you didn't agree with Bush, I mean, he was always honorable and always respectful, except that when he ran his re-election campaign, he did demonize gay people, but... And uh, other than that, and also he implied that Democrats don't love America. But other than those things, I mean, you know, a very sensible and very uh, civil man. Yeah. But the thing is, any chance of us hitting up a ram get, fails because we get stuck in this Iraq quagmire, which greatly depletes America, America's trust at the time. Yeah, the military and our military might had really... we. America's pride in itself had really been caught up in a kind of um, militarism, if you will, that takes a big hit from Iraq. You know? And the fact that we went in there and did what we did, and they not only didn't embrace us, but, I mean, some of them did, but a lot of them didn't, and were fighting us tooth and nail. Uh, you know, none of this boded well at all. No. So I think, you know, if... Because, you know, the, the big story in the, for me in the last few years is kind of just the the death of liberalism and it really starts here with uh, in many ways i mean at least like the the the, the failure 
of that kind of liberalism being put forward by the neoconservatives to take off in Iraq and the kind of blunder that they have. And remember, the fact these people are not accepting of separate opinions. It wasn't like you could read the National Review at that time and get a good, um, you know, get a, a, an editorial against the Iraq War. You weren't going to get that. You know, and I know I'm bashing the National Review. I'll say the National Review's credit. The last few years, you actually can get interesting debates in the National Review. Well, maybe not interesting, so make it taken a little too far, but at least you get debates, you know. The National Review at this time is simply a propaganda magazine for the Bush administration. If you wanted to find a conservative who was going to say anything against the Iraq War, you have to go hunt down the American conservative, which is still a minor magazine, but it's really minor at that time. It only, it only, it stock only increases as the Iraq War unravels, you know. Um, so this, these, these people cannot accept criticism, and that's a big thing too. You know, even in two thousand six, when Bush lost the midterms, he still tried to keep Rumsfeld on for a minute. I mean, they had to basically tell him like, "No, you need to get rid of him now." I'm the decider. No? That's when he did his famous line about being the decider, and he said he's deciding that it's best for the country to keep Rumsfeld. Hmm. But uh, yeah, no, Bush um, was also another one who valued people who were personally loyal to him and that he liked. So he kept on yeah. people who should have been fired long after their expiration date. Because by 2006, there was excessively abundant evidence that Donald Rumsfeld was a bad choice. He had done poor work across the board. Also, by this point, the military contracting system had become deeply corrupt. As soon as the Iraq War starts, there's basically a federal auction site where contractors can bid on contracts, and the lowest bidder gets to take the contract and then fulfill it. And this leads to all kinds of waste, fraud, and abuse. There's a famous movie, yeah. War Dogs, about this with Jonah Hill. Mm. And That's it makes, a good movie. Yeah, and it shows that some of the people who filled these contracts are literally just like high school graduates who formed a fake company, made some bullshit initials up to make it sound fancy, and just started taking these contracts that they had no ability to fulfill, really, and then just kind of winging it and half-assing it until they made it rich. This was a yeah. slipshod operation from start to finish, and it's incredible to think about the U.S. government and the U.S. military in particular operating in this way. But that is how the Bush administration allowed this to happen because they believed in laissez-faire economics in an extreme sense where you don't even have to have any qualifications. You just kind of go out there and buck around until you figure it out, I guess. Put people's lives on the line that way, whatever. Well, to get into the 2004 election, I know in 2003 there is Medicare Part D. Yes. And you want to mention that for a bit. <clears throat> Anything you want to say about Medicare, Medicare Part D? So Medicare Part D um, is what makes prescription drugs a little bit more affordable for seniors. However, Bush did not allow the federal government to negotiate drug prices. So this means that while it does help seniors, it is incredibly expensive and there is no, are no cost controls, so one thing it will do is drive up the cost of both medicine and healthcare in general. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. At the time, in the immediate aftermath of its passage, however, it does look pretty good for Bush. And because of that, McConnell is convinced to this day that that is what decided the 2004 election. The fact that Bush was able to pass this one major piece of domestic legislation. And that's why he insists upon stopping literally everything the Democrats want to do. Because he thinks that that's how you prevent them from getting reelected. Is to just stop them cold. If they have no achievements, then they can't get reelected. That's his political theory, in a nutshell. Uh, but as far as Medicare Part D itself, uh, once again, if you're going to try to reform health care, you have to allow the federal government to negotiate drug prices. Otherwise, without the cost controls, the middlemen who run these companies soak up profit and do so without any regard for how much it actually costs to make drugs or actual research costs or anything like that. Mm. But I guess actually uh, low-key Medicare Part D might still be Bush's greatest achievement. 
Yeah, I think so. Probably. I mean, I can't think of anything else he did that's better than that. Yeah, I mean, the No Child Left Behind act was pretty bad. The no Child Left Behind failed. Uh, standardized testing became the norm. That was a shit show. Uh, what other initiatives did he really have? Um, I yeah, can't think no of any Child that Left actually Behind worked. That, uh... No Child Left Behind put us on that Soviet education model. You know what I'm talking about? You know, the whole, like... You know, you you don't need liberal arts. All you need is a uh, science. Uh, Was it science, technology, engineering, and math? Yeah. Well, you have to ask yourself a, an important question: Is our children learning? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we got this guy who is borderline illiterate, running, uh, trying to reform education, and yeah. uh, well, we got about the quality of product you'd expect out of that, didn't we? Yeah, there there was I mean he had other things too going on with foreign policy. I remember relations with Russia were decent enough until you get to around like two thousand and eight with the uh Georgia stuff. Yes. Of course a, a variety of, of free trade agreements. Also a lot of that was because Bush uh looked in tr Putin's eyes after nine eleven and Putin described like going into a fire to get a cross that was his mom's or some shit. And then Bush is like, I've looked into Putin's eyes. He's a good man. He's a good Christian. I can trust him. Work with him. Oh yeah. God. One thing about one thing about Bush is that this man was a sucker. If you just offered up a little bit of the Jesus juice. If you say you're a man of faith, yeah. hey, he's all in for it. Are you trying to tell me that uh, Putin was able to play Bush? Is that what you're telling me? Uh yeah, he played him like a fiddle. Embarrassing <laughs> shit. Uh Putin played Bush harder than he's played any other American president, bar none. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I mean, Bush had all tough shit. But anyway, um, 2004 election, we should say, uh, is going to be with John Kerry. I know we've talked about that one before. Uh, I'm of the opinion Kerry makes it closer than it probably should have been. Probably also doesn't help that by that time Bush is... Uh, approval rating is falling fast. Well, yeah, also, but, Kerry ran a really shitty campaign. I mean, the generic Democrat strategy, fucking ridiculous. He had no real initiatives. And then the swift boat attacks are probably what sank him, no pun intended, uh, where Bush... You know, I actually don't think... I, don't, I, I think the swift boat thing is way overstated. I really think it's overstated. I don't think it was that big a well, deal. Well, I mean, a lot of it was... Basically, they're arguing over who would be the better commander-in-chief for this mess Bush has created. Bush's argument is one part, don't change a horse in midstream or whatever Bushism he used to express that. So don't change streams in the horse or whatever. And um, Kerry's thing is, I'm a war hero and I will do a better job. Or to put it in his words, I will do the same things as George W. Bush, but I will do them better. I will make America better one syllable at a time. Kerry is interesting in one regard in particular. Uh, he is the first Democratic presidential candidate in our lifetime to be able to raise a lot of corporate money and not have problems doing it either. Yeah. You know. Because no, John... I mean, he literally, I mean, literally, he talked. I mean, you know, like like Bill Clinton and to a lesser degree Al Gore would would do some lip service towards uh, working class issues. Kerry doesn't even fucking bother in two thousand and four. Yeah, which is probably why a lot of those uh, establishment types always defend his campaign. Which I I think his yeah. campaign was a goddamn abortion, but. Um, anyway, I know there are people who are, no, it was actually pretty smart. No, it wasn't. Anyway, yeah, I, I guess I guess I'm more positive on it as terms of just a pure, a purely as a campaign. But at the same time, I get your I get your drift I mean, on that he, one. He let Bush I, define the debate. If you do that, well, it becomes a referendum, and referendums usually favor the person whose name is being uh, referendumed. If that's even a word. Well, John. The Democrats in 2004 have a very difficult position, though, which is not entirely dissimilar to Democrats in 1864. 
the war is still at this point, I wouldn't say popular, but it's still popular enough, if you will. And people would definitely prefer to win than lose. So, what argument can you make? You know, large factions of the Democratic Party want you to make the argument of get the fuck out of here, which is the same thing with 1864. But the person who gets nominated is not an anti-war Democrat. Like John Kerry doesn't say we're getting out of Afghanistan. We're not. Doesn't John Kerry doesn't say we're getting out of Iraq? Like you said, he says I'm just going to do it better. And it he almost kind of falls onto a position like McClellan was making. McClellan is essentially telling people vote for me. I'm going to keep the war going, but I will do it better than Lincoln, and without trampling on your civil liberties. That's that's. That is the McClellan. That and uh, the uh, his his distaste for emancipation is what McClellan's selling. Right. John Kerry, all he can sell is I'm competent, but he doesn't out. He he neither. So he can't make a pure anti-war argument. He also did not really hit Bush up personally very hard. You know, I mean, he could just been like, "This guy's a moron. This guy's obviously a moron, and these people are fucking up right now." I mean. But they say he could have made that kind of argument. He could have been like, you know what? Screw this Bush guy. Put all your faith in me. I'll win this goddamn war. He could have. He could have made a Rambo argument, I guess, right? Yeah, no, he could have. I mean, he could have done a lot of things differently. I mean, or he could have even just tried to push everything onto his um, domestic agenda. He could have tried to shift the conversation if he didn't think he'd win that. Or rather, than just saying I'll be more competent. Give some examples of things he plans to do that Bush isn't doing. Or point out some of the specific fuck ups of the Bush administration, some of the corruption. Remember, I mean, there's a lot of things you could hit that are specific, rather than just being like, "I'll just be better," you know, vaguely. Trust me. Well, he, he can't do he can't do the domestic stuff because remember, he's he's John Kerry. Uh, you know, he's he's a, a, a uh, how would I put it? You know, yeah, he's a neoliberal Democrat. And his one of his one of his plans was to downplay the domestic stuff to raise a whole bunch of money, which on that regard, mission accomplished. John Kerry raises a fuckload of money. Yeah. You know, um, that's why I meant like that's one of the reasons why I actually think he made it more competitive than otherwise, because there are people who want the war to go on there. The people going to vote for him are going to be the anti-war people. And those are Democrats anyway. Those who genuinely do feel that we need to win this war, but Bush is not the man for it. And he's able to raise a whole lot of cash. I mean, John Kerry comes really close to beating Bush numerically, right? And you know what state he really loses been... that everybody always points out? Ohio. Ohio. Because uh, you know how you win Ohio, you talk about outsourcing. And Kerry said not a word on that because he took too much corporate word. money. If he had so just talked a little time... bit about outsourcing in Ohio, he would have been president in 2004. But you know that the 2004 thing, you know, you, ha you have to kind of wonder: uh, does does Bush even like notice? Like, hey, I almost got beat by a rather lame challenger. Oh fuck no! He claimed a mandate. He said, "I got a mandate." He did. <laughs> yeah. God damn. No, he, that's what he did. And not only did he have a mandate, but you know what he said? He had a mandate to do something that was not popular and that he did not emphasize really or run on much. He said he had a mandate to privatize Social Security. Yeah. Well, he looked into the whole uh, banning gay marriage idea, or just making marriage strictly between a man and a woman. He looked at that for a minute. The corporate money wasn't behind it. There wasn't enough enthusiasm. He wasn't going to get the amendment. So, yeah, he shifts to what really matters, right? Yeah. And, I mean, so he's looking for another equivalent to the Bush tax cuts. And uh, it fails because, you know, no one wants to fucking do that, at least among the people. And also keep in mind, 2004 election, another thing is that he was very negative. Uh, not only did he demonize anybody who didn't agree with him as being anti-American, but also really ran hard against uh, the gay community. Because he yeah. ran against gay marriage, which at that point was not really in danger of talking anytime soon. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, Bush ran a terrible campaign in terms of it being civil, and then he came out of it, mandate, I barely won, let's make a massive change to the country that I didn't really talk about as a candidate. So, in my opinion, that's honestly just claiming that mandate to then do something horrible. 
Uh, one, it ignores what a mandate is because not only you, you not only have to win with a decent majority, but also you need to win on that issue to claim a mandate. But two, just trying to do that and really fuck people over in that way so profoundly, I think that that's maybe one of the biggest black marks of his entire record. Of all the black marks, I mean, because there's plenty, but that's, I think, one of the big ones. Do you know I think was the really a really big one, though? Um, oh, yeah, it's definitely black mark. Well, I think it was on the, one of the things interesting about the 2004 election that was talked about a bit that time was the defeat of Tom Daschle. Did you know about that? Um, I know he was a Democrat. Was he the House Majority Leader? Or I know he was a high-ranking Democrat. I can't remember exactly how high, though. Yeah, he's the, he's the Senate. He was the uh, uh, Senate uh, Minority Leader. Uh, and keep it in mind, you know, the 2000 election, the Republicans had lost four Senate seats. They managed to gain, and then, oh, that's right, and then one of the Republicans, I forget his name, actually jumped ship to the Democrats. After Bush Arlen got, Specter. After Bush. Not Specter, nope. That's oh, his name. It's a different guy. Oh. It's a different guy. Uh, Daschle loses his seat in 2004. And keep in mind, I mean, he's, he's, the, he's the Senate leader, and even before that, I mean, Tom Daschle was a name you heard a whole lot in the 1990s. And I don't think I've heard of him since then. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I think like how we right. go to the Tom yeah, Daschle Wikipedia right. page, you'd be like, so what happened to this guy? Like, what'd he do <laughs> afterwards? Um, so, yeah, they, I mean, claiming a mandate to be, f- they, they do gain four Senate seats and defeat the Democratic Senate leader. Not an unimpressive achievement in that regard. Uh, but yeah, it, the mandate. Yeah, the Social Security thing, he's going around. It's obviously not working. The attempt, I mean, some people argue the attempt was half hearted. I think they just realized it wasn't going to work. You know, that, that you know, that, that, that it was, um, that it, that it, by that time, too, the Republican Party, because keep in mind that old people voted Democrat up until about this time. I know it sounds weird. People are like, wait, wait, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, no, when I was a kid, one of the thoughts you have about Democratic voters is they're older because they were, you know, New Deal generation. Uh, that's just not the case. So I think there was also this idea of like, now wait, if we do this, we could really depress turnout with the demographic that has turned in our favor in the last few years. You know? Yeah, because as the boomers are starting to age at this point, uh, they're wanting to keep those senior votes. And if they fuck over Social Security, well, guess what? Uh, that's going out the window. Yeah. So, um, let's see, what else about this particular period? So now we're in 2005, um, the Social Security attempt fails, Iraq continues to get worse, we won't get the insurgency until I think 2006 though, right? Or not, I mean, uh, not the insurgency, but the uh, surge, yeah. Yeah, that's when they put in charge. That's when a lot of the people who had been very critical of how the Iraq war when prosecuted finally got uh, positions, you know. Yeah. Uh, David Petraeus, uh, Gates, who will be Secretary of Defense under uh, Bush and then under Obama for a period of time as well. Um, but yeah, no, 2005, uh, you get what some will consider to be the decisive moment, though, because, you know, the war in Iraq is going poorly. It's getting worse. Yeah. Bush cannot get the Social Security thing through. The gay marriage amendment doesn't go through either. It's starting to look very listless. And then some minor event happens in New Orleans. Yeah. I know nothing uh, about it. A bit of a hurricane, from what I recall. Yeah. Not the most talked about could, hurricane of all time. What'd you say? It's definitely not the most talked about natural disaster in recent memory. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so Hurricane Katrina hits, and it hits like an atomic bomb. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably um, worth the stream into itself, you know. Um, I guess we can go through the yeah, major yeah. highlights, though. Oh, I could go into the... I mean, that, that would be going to the nitty-gritty of some things that happened, but now I actually cut Bush slack for the first few days. The governor of Louisiana, Kathleen Babineau Blanco, failed to call in 
uh, failed to call in for assistance. The mayor of New Orleans, uh, Ray Nagin, how can I say, he uh, he did eventually call a mandatory evacuation, which I want to say might have been the first in New Orleans history. But keep in mind, too, that you know Katrina was very moved very fast and got strong very quickly and had 20-foot storm surge. Uh, the one that just passed us, Ida, had an 11-foot storm surge, you know, as a comparison, right? So one mean, bad storm and very, very quick. Where I would really fault Bush is what happens afterwards. And I, I was, there was a guy on the tour a few days ago, and I could tell you it was somebody who thinks that people were too hard on Bush uh, with this because he said, oh, they threw everything on his shoulders. And he says, obviously, he had local fears. I'm like, oh, definitely. I mean, hell, the mayor, Mark Morial, did a bunch of mistakes as well. Although I've, I've never, I've, I've been upset that he avoided any blame for what happened at Katrina when he was the one who stuffed the levee board in New Orleans with lackeys and idiots. Yeah. You know, just, you know, completely unqualified people. Yeah, I think, uh, I think time, really Katrina paying. is sort of the ultimate example of what happens when the federal system fails, where you have local incompetence, state incompetence, national incompetence all at the same time. Yeah, I, I have the most sympathy for Nagin. If, if Nagin had a big problem, it's that he really just collapsed right under the pressure. And... You know, that, that, that doesn't mean I'm going to – I cut him some slack for that because of all the people involved. He has the fewest resources to work with. I heard – I don't know if you it know. was the mayor or whether it was some sheriff, but I know at one point when FEMA started to intervene under the inspired leadership of Brownie, Mike Brown, um, who was a horse trainer by profession who got to be the head of FEMA because he's one of Bush's butt buddies. So he gets in, yep. and he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing running FEMA. So, it's a shit show from the outset, and one of the things that they want to do is cut all the power lines set and just kind of start over. And this is after FEMA's gotten involved, obviously. So, this is a terrible idea because this will cut off power to hospitals. And so, some of the mayor, some of the sheriffs in Louisiana have to actually post men at Transformers, and he gives a message to FEMA that says, if you come and try to cut these lines, my deputies will shoot you. So there's almost a, a fucking firefight between FEMA and local authorities. Hey, funny, I'd never heard of that one. And not unheard of in Louisiana. Now, which parish was that again with the police? I don't know. All I know is that I, I had a friend who was an undergrad who was trying to accumulate basically all the stories out of Louisiana about Katrina. And that was one of them that I remember he would always tell. Uh, I, I don't know what... There I assume this is not far from New Orleans, but I don't really know. Well, it's probably Jefferson Parish, I would assume. Uh, there is, uh, because, you know, I know you want to do a corruption thing about Illinois and Louisiana. And, of course, Louisiana, I'd be talking about a number of people, Edwin Edwards, uh, Leander Perez. Uh, and I read a biography of Leander Perez in, uh, I say, early 2020, I want to say it was. Anyway, great biography. But anyway, uh, Leander Perez in the 1940s, he was like the the dictator of Plaquemines Parish. And he essentially was the dictator of Plaquemines Parish from the 1920s to the 1960s. That's a hell of a dynasty. So he did a similar thing when he was in a dispute with the governor of Louisiana, who actually sent state troopers down to Plaquemines Parish. And they met them at the road with guns and were like, you come in here, we're shooting you. You know, so... There's a tradition in Jefferson and Plaquemines Parish of sometimes being like, you know, this is our own little fiefdom here, and you ain't fucking touching it. You know? Yeah. Um, and then uh, Bush, did his his famous, case, yeah, we got... Bush did his famous flyover of the state without getting out or going yeah. to visit anyone. This is really where the mistakes really, really come in, is just the sluggishness of the response, the incompetence of FEMA. And you know, the thing about Katrina, too, is that the harshest critics of Bush get proven right then. Before that, a lot of people were like, you know, they're like, oh, are you sure about this? And I'd be like, look, this man is incompetent. Uh, he is, he, 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 he doesn't know how to actually handle bad situations because everything's pretty much been easy his whole life. And he has a bit of a trust in Jesus, trust my advisors mentality. He does not react swiftly to things. He doesn't really care. He's removed. 
These are this is a party for the wealthy. And furthermore, he has stocked his government with people who actually do not know what they're doing. And all of this comes together in, with with uh, Hurricane Katrina. And yeah, he gets blamed a lot for the response. The response is very poor. He does the flyover, which is fucking disgraceful. I mean, Lyndon Johnson, two or three days after Hurricane Betsy, is in the water with the bullhorn, telling everybody this president's here, right? And that's a big thing to keep in mind, too. Hurricane Betsy, the one that hit in the 1960s, uh, I want to say it was 67, was no... Or was it 65? Yeah, 1965. Uh, Hurricane Betsy was not a minor storm. Hurricane Betsy flooded large parts of New Orleans, did a lot of damage. It's the first billion-dollar hurricane, as they say, in terms of the damage done. That said, the memory of Betsy in New Orleans is radically different from Katrina. I grew up with people talking about Betsy and be like, oh, yeah, Betsy was hard, but we got through that. You know, and... You know, people would like, you know, people were younger would be like, I remember my dad put me on his shoulders when we waited out of the home while the whole city, while like a large portion of the city are flooded, right? Yeah. So there's this idea of like, it was a bad storm, but we, we came through it and we're okay and we've seen worse since then. Man, we don't think that about Katrina. And I got to say, one of the reasons why is the federal government's response to Betsy is swift and effective mostly. Yeah. Bush is sluggish and competent. It was a goddamn fucking mess down here, you know? And, I mean, people already didn't trust this man, but the amount of rage I saw being thrown at him. And, you know, the people... The thing about it is it, it had an interesting effect in Louisiana. The Republicans around here, their defenses of Bush started to get a little more muted. They'd be like, oh, well, other people screwed up too. And we're like, yeah, we get it, but he screwed up, right? At the same time, though, the fact that the Democratic governor fucked up so bad, the Democratic Party of Louisiana has never quite recovered from. Because before that, they could still win statewide races. Right now, the only statewide office held by a Democrat is John Bell Edwards, the governor. And that's because he has a lot of connections in Cajun country. He's well-liked by people who know him in Louisiana, so good reputation. But also, he is a pro-life Democrat, and he means it. You know? Like, if they, put, if they put legislation in front of him that would ban abortions in this state, and as long as he, you know, there's a good chance he would sign them. He already had signed, he already signed abortion restrictions into law, which a lot of Democrats around here understandably complained about. But I was like, guys, if he didn't, he wouldn't get reelected. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, one other thing about the levies in New Orleans, from what I understand, is that the contractors were using subpar materials to keep them up and pocketing the savings, and that was the main issue, at least in New Orleans proper with Katrina. That was a big one. That was a very big one. The The levies, were, the levies did not uh, hold up as well as they were supposed to. They also weren't being inspected properly. That goes back to Mark Morial. Yes, inferior... Uh, things were being used too, and also there was just this general feeling with Katrina, where it's like you know our troops and our resources and our attention is being wasted in Iraq when it should be used in America. Which I think you is know. a feeling that has been very consistent over the last fifteen to sixteen years. Yeah, like why, like we're looking around at a crumbling infrastructure. Like why are we blowing money on foreign countries? Countries also hate us, too. It's not like Iraq wants us to hang around there, do they? I mean, last nope. I heard. Not that I've heard. Fucking, uh, I mean, God, I mean, at least when you blow up Germany and Japan, you get to have, like, an ally. Well, also, so uh, another thing about Bush's handling of Katrina, which was reminiscent of his handling of Iraq, is that when they were talking about rebuilding, he wanted to make this a free enterprise zone, basically run it the way that they were running Iraq. So have an area with no regulation and let corporations do what they want to rebuild the city and appoint someone to basically be a czar-like figure in F. Paul Brimmer. And that was Bush's dream for how to run New Orleans at that time. It didn't end yeah. up happening quite that way, but that was the plan. They did manage to make all the schools around here charter schools. Yeah, which is another part of the Bush dream at the time. And something that Republicans haven't given up on yet. No, I mean, well, I mean, Milton Friedman wrote an uh, op-ed very soon after, which was the equivalent of, don't let this disaster go to waste. We can save the New Orleans school system, which, uh, being fair to the charter movement, 
the Nolan school system was a it was the worst in the country for any major city. It's still pretty damn bad, by the way. And right before Katrina hit, a large chunk of money from the school system just went missing. No one to this day knows who stole it. So you had a scandal-ridden, completely incompetent school system. That really is a prime target for saying, like, let's go ahead and try charter schools, because you know what? I mean, what you're doing ain't working right now, and you people are desperate, right? But it does have different another effect as well. Uh, the black middle class of New Orleans, in large part, was based on teachers. Oh, well, they almost all got fired, and then replaced with idealistic progressive kids who wanted to go like help uh poor black kids out for a year or two that being like the teach for america crap you know what i mean which is all really just a way to undermine schools in general well so teach anyway, for america thing is also the idea is that as a teacher you go to a low-income area for a few years you pay off your college debts and then you use that experience to then get a a cushy high school job or move out of teaching altogether to get a higher paying job. It looks good in your resume, you know. Yes, yeah, a resume you know, builder. It's, and it's kind of like, in some ways, it's sort of like an equivalent to military service in the sense that it, it mostly you use it as a stepping stone to something else. Yeah. So these experienced, these teachers, you know, now I, I'm not going to comment on how good or bad they were. I don't want to like, on the one hand, I don't want to go around just blaming teachers uh, but I also, you know, I'm pretty sure a number of them probably were just incompetent getting a check because, I mean, once again, it's a broken school system. But with their firing, the black middle class of New Orleans was eviscerated. And their neighborhood, really, New Orleans East, has been pretty bad ever since then. You know, but once again, we don't think about the economic damages involved, do we? Nope. No. No, we don't. I mean, who cares about the... Who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Sorry. They just don't, I mean, unless that person has money, they don't really have a voice in current day America. Yeah. We don't care if we took away your factory. We don't care if we took away all your teacher jobs. And once again, I mean, some of those people probably did need to get fired, right? But they couldn't all be incompetent. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, so, even teachers who might not be the very best uh, academically, I mean, some of them still are a part of the community, and they still help kids. They still have a role. And, um, yeah. And also, the whole thing is, if you're over the course of a 30-year teaching career, you're probably going to have some ups and downs. So even if you aren't good at one particular point in your career, that doesn't mean that your whole career you were shit. So some people have a slow start. Other people might sag around the middle. Other people might get lazy at the end. But, yeah, I mean, not uh, that's the whole thing about a 30-year career. There are going to be ups and downs. It's not going to be consistently one thing or the other, but anyway. Yeah. And now, so I was going to say, yeah, no, so anyway, the um, uh, Katrina really, uh, Bush is pretty listless after that, but 2006 holds very few charms for him. The Republicans will be roiled by a series of uh, scandals affecting a variety of their congressional candidates. And then you have the border crisis. And the border crisis is the one that I call the revenge of the paleoconservatives. Yeah. Because this is where Bush and the Republicans find out that while they might be for, you know, loose immigration, a path to citizenship for illegals, uh, their voters aren't. Yeah. You know. And that was the one thing where Bush, uh, I think that was one opening Bush left in terms of uh, letting his base down. I mean, he let him down on some other stuff too, right? Like, I mean, if you let's say in two thousand four you elected him because you really did want to stop gay marriage, well, that didn't go anywhere. He barely even fucking yeah. tried, you know. Although, I mean, he did uh, at least but, talk. He did the faith based uh, faith based initiative thing, so he was giving a bunch of money to religious groups, and he was he using was a lot of religious that, rhetoric in his speeches. I mean, he was the most explicitly religious president in recent memory. Yeah, of course, the evangelicals by tying their ship to him uh, to take quite a few hits from that. Also, I, I think the evangelicals, though, were also partially drunk on Bush because 
they were so used to being in the margins of the Republican Party. Like the Republicans come around when they need like fundraising, some money, and of course votes, right? But you know, they're the evangel straight up evangelicals are not getting hired to go write for like commentary or the Weekly Standard or National Review or any number of uh, neoconservative rags, you know. Uh, so you know, they're very much people who are on the outs. I, I feel like with Bush, that's one of the reasons they did rally to him in that regard. He's one of us. You know, we finally have one of us in you know, the highest reaches of power. But yeah, the, the, the border crisis thing really shows that the Republican Party is a party that is for border rec control, restricted immigration. The attempt was made to get out of that. That failed. And that's actually where Bush's approval rating craters. And I will tell you, Republicans that I knew, a lot of them, that's when they turned against Bush. It wasn't over Iraq as much. It was over immigration. Yeah, I think you're right. And now, and now, honestly, I'd say Bush is hated at this point amongst lots of Republicans, um, especially after he gave that like ridiculous 9-11 speech like, recently. Um, so anyway... So yeah, the uh, 2006 comes around, uh, and what's the other thing? Oh yeah, yeah, you have the, uh, the, the 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 Democrats at that time. They had hired Howard Dean to run the DNC, right? And yeah, I know you have some thoughts on that. Well, up to that point, I'd kind of liked Howard Dean uh, because in 2004, during the primary cycle, he was my preferred candidate, and of course, he didn't win. Um, but as pretty much as soon as he became the DNC guy, along with Rahm Emanuel, he kind of just became one of the herd. And since then, he's only been an establishment Democrat who has tried his best to undermine the left, even though he ostensibly belonged to the left up until that point. So I find Howard Dean to be a very disappointing person. Then again, I feel like I was kind of suckered in by Howard Dean the same way a lot of people got suckered in by Andrew Yang. Uh, why do you mention Andrew Yang in particular? Well, both of them talked a lot about technology in the future. That was because that, okay. that was part of why I like Dean because Dean actually sounded like he had a plan for the future. He realized that times were changing; we have to adapt to the time. Uh, so he sounded a lot more forward thinking than all these other politicians who all sounded the same, and we're all talking about the same boomer shit. Like, did Bush dodge the draft or not? Okay, I don't care. I wasn't alive for the Vietnam War. I don't care if he dodged the draft or who fought in the war. What I care about is policy. And Dean was one of the few people who seemed like he was actually thinking about what's next. So he's talking about the influence of the internet. He's talking about things that most of these other boomers weren't talking about. And I think that's what appeals to Yang, uh, why a lot of people are attracted to Yang now, is because he talks about the future. He talks about possibilities. He talks about things changing. Yeah, I, I guess I was also thinking their styles are just so different. Well, not, you know, stylistically, Dean... they're not that similar. But, I mean, in terms of just their sort of forward thinking, which I guess is more limited than it seems on the surface, but at least just the rhetoric of it is at least interesting. Now, you say suckered. Uh, do you think the Yang supporters are suckers or something? A little bit, yeah. I mean, Yang is not a very talented politician. But anyway, I don't want to talk about Yang too no. much. I got you. I mean, I, I can see what you're saying there. I I, uh, I, uh, I like him, but um, I'm not like Yang Gang, you know? <laughs> yeah! Of course, I, I guess... I guess nobody is at this point. Oh, you're doing the yeah thing for yeah. Howard Dean? They just played that over and over again? Yeah, no, that's the thing yeah, that you... killed him. And also, the local rock station where I lived at the time, they'd added that to their um, whatever before they'd play music. Like, this is 98.9 FM. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> you see, it was funny. I, I, I He did that, and they just played it up as some stupid thing. And I was like, I felt like it was really just like a media hit job because I thought, look... He had disappointing showing in Iowa, and he's trying to show his supporters he's still in the fight. Yeah, I mean, it, really, it's not much of a scandal. In terms of scandals, this is, if there are 100 levels, this is level one. Yeah. It also be kept in mind, though, that this really is a time when uh, Democrats are a bit 
obsessed with like the politics of decorum, if you will. You know, right? Like, they, oh they, yeah, they, we, they, we have to be super serious. The contrast with that goofball Bush. We need somebody intellectual yeah. and stern and serious. Right. Uh, you know, just you know, very. Uh, I mean, that's that's really gone. That really went out the window with Trump. You know, now there is a. Uh, now there, now there is like um, rude and vicious as any Republican of that era, you know. So that really went out the window around this time. But no, the a two thousand six thing. I know Howard Dean is put in charge of the DNC, which he kind of revitalizes it. They do a fifty state strategy, and they end up winning that night more seats than they were projected to win. Although I would say historically, winning thirty one seats with a party that had that many problems with, with scandal and a president whose approval rating was falling quite rapidly is not as really that as impressive as other seat changes, would, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think 2006 is a little overrated. That being said, because it was a victory brought about primarily by Rahm Emanuel, it gets, it gets mentioned as the Thumpin'. That's the official name of it. Where did Democrats... That's, that, that's what Bush called it. Well, the that Bush called Bush that. That's also the establishment. Republic uh, Democrats took that up though, and that that's yeah. their blueprint for the future. Because Rahm Emanuel's strategy was, anytime there was a new candidate emerging, he would only back them if he thought they would have a chance of winning. I.e., if they were a centrist. That's the only way you could get federal money in two thousand six. So you had to be a well, centrist, yeah, and you needed to be in a district where it was possible for you to win, according to him. Even though there were people, also- oh, go ahead. Now, I was going to say, this also, this is when you get that blue dog coalition that's going to be a sizable part of the Democrats for about four years until they get, you know, slaughtered in 2010. Yeah, and then uh, also there were people who ran, who Rom didn't like, uh, and so he didn't back. So one of them is actually Joe Sestak, who's basically a moderate Democrat from Pennsylvania, but for whatever reason, Rahm Emanuel didn't like him and didn't approve of his campaign. So he got no help from the DNC one anyway. And there were plenty of other people, mostly somewhat on the left, who also won. But Rahm Emanuel tried to take full credit for their victories, even though he basically told them, I don't support you, I think you're a lost cause. Uh, And then there were also people he backed who did lose, including uh, a younger version of Tammy Duckworth. Because it turns out Tammy Duckworth is very difficult to elect, even in blue Illinois. (laughs) <laughs> you, uh, love to, you love talking about Tammy Duckworth. Well, yeah. I mean, she's literally the Rahm Emanuel project. I mean, I feel like he's just thinking, God damn, I'm good. I'm going to get Tammy Duckworth elected to something. Just watch. And that'll prove how brilliant <laughs> I am. Because if I can do that, I can do anything. And eventually they <laughs> did do it. Uh, but it took about three attempts, I think. God. And this is running for statewide races in one of the bluest states in the country. And, and they still struggled like hell to get her in office. That's depressing. Um, I mean, you know, well, unless you're Tammy Duckworth, you do eventually win, huh? <laughs> Not only that, but it's like your friends will go to you, oh, no, you did great. Never mind that you lost. You snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. You did great. We're going to run you again. Don't worry. We'll keep running you till you win. You get infinite yeah. lives in this game. <laughs> we so got the Konami ha- code. Do you want to answer uh, some super chats and then we get into uh, Bush's last few years and the uh, financial crash? Sure. So I guess before we get to the surge and some of his other uh, late game fuck ups, we'll talk about uh, a few super chats. First up is Motor for ten dollars. Thank you, sir. Was Caesar largely wiping out a third of the Gauls, displacing and finally integrating the other thirds? Also, vis-a-vis Pakistan, what are your opinions of Bush's dealings with Pakistan? Um, I think the quote from Caesar is. I killed one third of the Gauls, enslaved another third, and left the other third to live under Roman power. So, uh, yeah, a little worse than that, if anything. It wasn't so much displacement as enslaved, which was great if you're a landowner back in Italy, and god-awful if you're a Gaul. Um, Yeah, Bush's invasion of Gaul literally is a genocide. That's something I'm actually going to be teaching about tomorrow morning. But I don't want to get too deep into that for now. Just, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, Caesar's conquest of Gaul might have been the most brutal of the Roman conquest, aside from possibly Trajan's conquest of Dacia. But uh, anyway, in terms of mm. Bush's dealings with Pakistan, what do you think about that, Sean? What do you think of his handling of uh, Pakistan during 
his presidency? I don't, I don't know a ton. I remember that Pakistan, towards the end of his administration, was looking pretty destabilized. But then nothing bad has happened since then, it would seem. Um, I, well, I say nothing. I'm sorry. I speak out of turn. When I say nothing bad, uh, the dire predictions of the immediate future do not come to fruition is what I mean. Apologies for talking out of line on that. Um, but uh, not, I, I don't really know uh, a ton, honestly. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. Who was was that? Still Musharraf back in the 2000s as the leader of Pakistan. You don't know. At the, I'm pretty sure it was still General Musharraf, and then he got overthrown. And at the danger was that he'd be overthrown by Islamic terrorists because the border with Pakistan and Afghanistan was pretty porous. And I know somebody yeah. from Karachi, and he says that sometimes fighters from Afghanistan will cross over and attack in the cities. Mm. So, um, yeah, point. Pakistan is still in trouble. It's not as de as unstabilized as it was right at that moment, like you said. I mean, things have kind of stayed at a steady rate of low-grade crisis, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, that's that's what it looks like to me. But I, I, once again, I really don't know enough about Afghanistan. I mean, about Pakistan. Yeah, I don't either. I think one of the things that keeps them together to some extent is that they have the threat of India on their east. And that provides a little bit of national unity, because even though there's a lot of internal division, both Pakistan and India internally believe that the other one has been the aggressor in all their wars. Oh, of course. Yeah, so th that's one interesting thing that I always find when I meet people from either country, is that according to them, the other side has started 100% of all the conflicts between them. <laughs> And this includes, I mean, all the people I've met in this context, by the way, are not just like random Pakistanis and Indians. I mean, these are all people who are like PhD students, and they all believe this too, so. That's nationalism for you. Well, you know, so uh, what's our next one? All right, our next one comes to us from Oscar Palacios. I believe that's how he said to pronounce it when I talked to him last time. Five dollars. Thank you, Oscar. Opinion about the new Dune. Saw it at an, I saw it at HBO. Thought it was boring. Then I saw it in the movie theaters. Uh, night and day, nine out of ten. I don't like Paul though. He was bland. Have you seen it, Sean? Yeah, I saw an IMAX Friday. Oh shit, me too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did also. I mean, I think I, we're talking about maybe doing a whole Dune stream though, right? You want to do a Dune stream sometime? I'm uh, down. maybe. I mean, fuck no, no, dude. You hey, you you want to do a tier ranking for the Dune characters? Like, it's my favorite book uh, ever. Uh, love the Lynch movie. I know it's got flaws though. I'll be the first to tell you that. Although the there's an edit on YouTube you can watch done by a guy named Spice Diver that's really good because you know the 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 two versions we have the TV version and the theatrical version are messy to say the least. You know, yeah. The so Spice Diver edit actually makes it into. A What'd you say? I still haven't seen the 2000 miniseries. It sucks, man. It just... I mean, it's, there, a few of the actors are pretty good, but it just looks cheap. And it just... The actors aren't really that good for the most part. Uh, the, I thought it was... I just thought it was crap, man. You know? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. It, the Fremen were pretty well done in that one. I'll say that for it. You know, but I mean, it's an early, it's, 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 it's a, it's a 2000 miniseries for sci-fi channel. You know, it's, it has that kind of look, if you will. Right. You know? But even then, I, God, the starter car looked fucking stupid in that, in that miniseries. They have these big puffy hats. They look, they look like Renaissance reject warriors, you know? Like yeah, I mean, ceremonial that, Renaissance that, warriors. Speaking of the starter car, my, one of my critiques of this new one visually is that their armor probably should have been black to look more menacing. They had like some sort of dull gray color that just kind of looked bland and generic. I could kind of see that, but I don't know. I, I, I fucking loved them. But I, I also love the starter car in the Lynch movie with those like radioactive hazard type, those like toxic waste hazard looking suits. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they looked, I thought those looked better than the ones in the new movie, honestly. 
Uh, yeah, I can agree with that, but I just <laughs> I did like him in this. I did like him in this movie. Uh, but uh, yeah, but anyway. So um, so, what do you think for the uh, one that's uh, out right now? Overall, I liked it. Um, I do have some critiques, but I guess we can save those if we ever go on and do the tier ranking and discussion of all that. But um, overall, I did enjoy it. One thing I was disappointed by, and not to say surprised by, is that uh, it ended up being just part one of the novel, because that was not apparent in the advertising. And um, the yeah, other, the other thing is that yeah, um, here's so just tonally, I thought it was maybe a bit too serious. I think it should have been just a tad more lighthearted. And part of it's because when they did try to have jokes, they had Jason Momoa do the jokes and he can't act. So that was part of the problem. <laughs> um, no, literally, no, Jason Momoa is there because women find him attractive. It's not he can't act, though. He's good at action, though. He's, he was really good in the sword fight scenes. But he would have actually probably made a better Gurney Halleck than uh, Duncan Idaho. Because Duncan Idaho is supposed to be graceful and smooth, whereas Gurney is supposed to be like a beast. Just he's big. Uh, so I feel like maybe if they had switched those two characters in terms of the actors. And then had... Well, they can know that one guy's a little too old to be Duncan. Because Duncan's supposed to only be about like 30 or whatever. No, I thought, I thought, I thought Josh Brolin was, uh, was a good Gurney Halleck. No, he was pretty good. I, he was fine. I'm just trying to think. I, the problem was that Jason Momoa and dialogue don't go together. But Duncan <laughs> Idaho has to be kind of charming and witty and uh, do good one-liners, and that is not Jason Momoa's strength. He's more of the silent type. Yeah. You're right. You see, he was good at the combat stuff, and he did he did kind of fit, in some regards, Duncan Idaho's look. If I'm mistaken, Duncan Idaho, Idaho is also supposed to be like a fairly large guy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's pretty large. Uh, but I, I feel like he's more of an Achilles than an Ajax, in the sense that um, it's not his size true. that makes him lethal so much as just his skill and his speed. Yeah, yeah I, uh, uh, the thing about him saying Paul was bland... Uh, Paul's pretty bland in the Lynch movie too, and he's even blander in the sci-fi miniseries. So sci-fi miniseries, he just he has like spiked hair, that, that like like that that like two thousand spiked hair oh cute God. guy look. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I yeah, do. it's fucking terrible, man. And I'm not holding anything against. I I'm I'm fine with Paul in both movies. You know, uh, Paul's always going to be a difficult one. I felt I think I liked Paul a little more in this one because they were showing more of the Benny Gesserit's uh, training that he had, and they really emphasized the relationship with his mother in this one. Yes, which is unlike the Lynch movie where they actually the Lynch movie they emphasize the relationship with his father. Right, even though the book you know. definitely emphasizes his relationship with Jessica more. Yeah. Uh, but I also felt that this movie, I, I did really like it. I, I'd probably say eight or nine out of ten. Um, yeah, I think I it's a solid eight. It. Yeah, I think I think one issue would probably be that uh, the relationship between him and his father, though, is not laid out very. It's not laid out that well in the movie. I thought, um, you know, you know, uh, there's a variety of good things I could say. Uh, I like the sandworms better in the Lynch one. They just look better. Um, this one though had much better action scenes. <laughs> uh, yes, no, the action scenes are much much better. It, it, and you know, I'm not saying that because it's not like '80s action scenes are less good because they're older. No, there's a fuckload of action. I mean, hell, the action in RoboCop is better than the action in Dune. All right, but I'm just saying, like, one of the weak points of the Lynch movie in particular is the action scenes. The, the, it's, the action scenes are just not great. You know, the only thing, the fight between Paul and Faye at the end is is solid. But anything else is just not good. Oh, there is a cut scene that they have in the uh, Spice Diver and TV edits where Paul fights Jamas. And that was actually pretty well done, the Lynch one. But, no, the action scenes were much, much better done in this one. Uh, some, st- some, some, some strong points from this one, of course, were Baron Harkonnen, uh, Count Raban, Love Stilgar. In this one, Javier Bardem was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, Paul, and I would actually especially say Jessica. I like Jessica in the Lynch one, but I thought she was much better in this one. Agreed. That being... Uh, 
What's her name? Rebecca? I don't know her real name, but I, I don't I think I've ever name. seen her before. No, she was excellent. I'm trying to think what I think was weak. Oh, uh, this is this is hands down true though. Pyre DeVries is way fucking better in the Lynch movie. That's like Brad Dorff's finest performance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, he's way better, and I don't know who they'll have for Fade Rautha yet, but I imagine he won't be as good as David Bowie. You mean Sting? Yeah, or Sting, whatever. Same difference. We should, well, I mean, these, we say that now, maybe Bowie, if you were going to cast Bowie in Dune, who would he have been? This is 80s Bowie, though, we're doing, it. so this is like the time he does Labyrinth, alright? Um, kind of I mean, Bowie probably do? also Fade Rautha, just because of the look. No, we, we, no, we still have Sting, though, so oh, who does so, Bowie play? Fuck, I mean, I, you can't really make him Paul, can you? I think he's maybe a little old for that. You could maybe make him... Um, can't make him Duncan Idaho, because he wouldn't do a straight action role. It would be t not uh, artistic enough for him. Um, hmm. God, I don't know. Maybe you could make him... I don't know what you could do with him, actually. You make him a Fremen of some kind? One of the Fremen warriors? No. If, we, if I was casting, if they would go to me like, you got to cast David Bowie, I'm like, all right. But I already have Sting playing Fade, and I don't want to change that because Sting's a great Fade. Uh, I would go with Piter or the Emperor. And the reason I say the Emperor is, I think I mentioned to you before, uh, the movie Last Temptation of Christ, David Bowie plays Pontius Pilate. And he's superb. Um, I don't know if you, if you I mean I, I highly recommend the movie but all that being said if you're just going to watch one scene watch the scene where Jesus talks to Pontius Pilate superbly done I could see him pulling off the emperor but actually I'd go with Piter for him yeah I'd go with Piter <laughs> of course that means I don't get Brad Dorff and that's like fucking Brad Dorff's finest role <laughs> Yeah. Is playing a is playing a twisted mintat. Yeah. <laughs> but right. no, he's excellent. No, I mean, <laughs> no, 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 seriously. It's one of my as before we go on, it's one of my favorite supporting role supporting performances in like a movie is is Brad Dorif in Dune. Yeah. <laughs> he steals every scene he's in. <laughs> um, okay, next up, well last super chat for now is a uh, modern guru for ten dollars. He says, Dear God, if you do a corruption show in Illinois and New Orleans, please have me on. I've lived in Illinois for almost 40 years. You'd need at least three shows just to cover Chicago alone. Seriously. Yeah, okay, cool. Then you can tell us uh, what your opinion is of that show Boss, where uh, Kelsey Grammer plays mayor of Chicago. You ever saw that? I have not heard of that. I saw it. I, I think it only ran two seasons. I... I liked it. I saw it because my friend Jonathan uh, was a big fan, and uh, I was like, you know what? I'll take a look at it. You know what I mean? Uh, but anyway, so getting back to a uh, good old bushy boy. Yep. Uh, w. Last last we left our uh, last we left our bumbling hero. He uh, took his uh, his thumping in two thousand six. Remember, Obama in two, is going to call two thousand ten the shellacking. Yes, so we got that one. All right. So he gets his thumping in. Uh, you're gonna have they're they're going to do the surge. A variety of people who are critical of the Iraq War are now in positions, which is one of the reasons why we definitely lose the Iraq War. And so far as we wasted money, people died. We did not en enhance our strategic position. I would say though, based on what I've read, that without the surge, it would have been an even worse defeat. So essentially, it's just we staunch the bleeding, if you will. Well, so this That's is when David sense. Petraeus emerges as the architect of the surge, and of course, the surge is just putting in more troops and also setting up more checkpoints. So it's literally just doing more of the stuff we're already doing. But yet, people are talking about him being a military genius, like the patent of our generation. It was just yeah, so that fucking was ridiculous. That was overplayed. I mean, no, look. On the one hand, the guy's definitely like better than most of the other generals. That's for fucking sure. Uh, that being said, the other thing with Petraeus too was. There was a lot of effort at various local alliances. It was also a big part of that too, you know. So that should be included in there as well. But yeah, you're right. More checkpoints, more soldiers, uh, better diplomacy, for lack of a better word. 
Um, yeah, like, like actually doing it by putting in translators. Because also another great uh, Bush era initiative, which we've mentioned before uh, in a different stream, is that right before Iraq, Bush, because he was anti-gay, decided that the military needed to be purged of gay people. And it turns out a lot of the translators, approximately half of them, were gay and got taken out of the military by this. So now mm. half the Arab translators are gone. And then we invade Iraq, where you're going to need lots of Arab translators. Yeah. Oops. Mm -hmm. Isn't there another Bush quote where he goes, oops, kind of offhandedly and kind of flippantly? <laughs> but anyway, um, as he said, you know, there's a saying in Tennessee. I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee. Fool me once, can't give... You know, what was it? Fool me once, shame on... Shame on you. Fool me twice. Can't get fooled again. Yeah. Yeah, now we're going to get into the... Uh, we got the housing crisis. We still have to cover... We, God, we didn't even cover torture, man. Oh, yeah. God torture's been going on this whole time, basically, because of the Patriot Act. Um, so as soon as we get into Afghanistan and Iraq, we start capturing people, sending them to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba... Um, most of what we do is illegal under our own laws, but then the Bush administration develops a doctrine where they try to reclassify it as enhanced interrogation. It becomes a whole legal battle. It gets protracted for many years. Um, there's also the Abu Ghraib scandal, I believe in 2005 or six, where U.S. soldiers were casually torturing sol uh, captives and making them do stacking naked and shit. I mean, it, uh, so... Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, lots of stuff. Oh, and in terms of um, corruption, which is still in the same era going on, even in 2006, uh, Blackwater, under the leadership of Eric Prince, is engaging in quite a bit of it. And also, Eric Prince is a fucking lunatic, by the way, who thinks that he is a latter-day crusader. And he and his top executives would meet together at a round table and act like they're the goddamn Arthurian knights. And no, I'm not making this up. And the operatives no, they would hire really. did operations that were technically illegal. So when the U.S. wanted to do something that was illegal or something that was questionable legally, we'd use mercenaries to do it. And Blackwater was at the forefront of that. And Eric Prince, the guy leading this group, thought he was a goddamn uh, bastard son of Richard the Lionheart. So what could go wrong? Religious fanatic in charge of something. Yeah, I know he's obsessed with the Templars. Um, yeah, uh, somebody pointed out that Petraeus was uh, more counterinsurgency than actual surge. Uh, yeah, no, that was his expertise yeah. as a theorist was um, counterinsurgency. And um, yeah. so, no. somebody mentioned Hugo Chavez. Bush started fear mongering and saber rattling against Venezuela around this time. Uh, that's where that whole what about Venezuela? They're a socialist hellscape talking point began. But Chavez, I remember the time Chavez had to like speak at a at some. It was like I, I have a time at like a UN thing. I think Bush had spoken there before him. So we got to the podium. He said something like, "Oh God, it smells like brimstone here." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God. But no, it's so the um, the 2007 we start getting the first inklings that there's gonna be problems in the economy. Now this has been spoken of by myself and others before, but not in any scientific way, if you will. It, very vague. Like we knew there was a lot of fake money going around that loans were being given out like candy. I also knew that the price of everything had gone up, but the wages hadn't. So people were starting to feel the squeeze. And of course, the subprime mortgage thing, you you had had efforts, which had begun in the Clinton administration, I believe, and Bush had accelerated them to get low-income people, particularly uh, people of color, uh, loans that it turns out they're not going to be able to pay, right? And the banks are all for this because, hey, they're getting flush with cash, right? Yeah. And as we get into 2008, while the Republicans and the Democrats are battling over 
over uh well the democrats are fighting over who's gonna become president and the republicans are fighting over who gets sacrificed to whoever the democrats nominate uh we get the housing collapse the financial crisis and or part of John this Stewart's was fueled uh as we mentioned last time in the clinton stream clinton had uh done a little bit to make sure that people who probably couldn't afford stuff could get loans easier and then Bush had an initiative which did much the same thing called the Ownership Society to try to encourage more people to buy property. Yeah. And between these two things, this is one thing where Bush was able to work with Democrats because they also thought it would be good to have low-income people uh, taking out loans and getting into debt. So, they all, well, I mean, that's what it was. I mean, they were trying to get people to buy expensive houses that they probably couldn't really afford. And... This is a large part of the crisis, is that the two parties agreed that people should be in debt, so that way you keep the working man working. Um, so yeah, they do this, and guess what? Whenever there's an economic downturn, it becomes really hard to pay your mortgage. Oh, and the mortgages can be then used by banks to invest in random shit, and you might even lose track of who owns the mortgage. Hmm, that can't go wrong. No, definitely not. All fine. All clear, man. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of people lost their homes. A lot of people are still bitter about it. I think that this is really what made someone like Jimmy Dore very political. He was one of the guys who lost his home because of this. Really interesting. And uh, I wonder if he bought it from Tim Dillon. He might have. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, he was He was selling this shit at the time. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, the, um, the, uh, the, the stock market collapses. I remember the day it did. I was working at Target that day. Is that when you were living in Pittsburgh, or? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was living in Pittsburgh. But yeah, no, the, um... The market collapsed, and what's interesting is that the uh, Congress the, rejected the first bailout. Remember that? Not really. Yeah, first one got rejected in Congress. A lot of Republicans rejected it, too. My theory on that is that by that time, the banks had really put a lot of money to Obama. So I, I think a lot of Republicans were like, well, if you're going to fund Obama, then fuck you. You know, so then they jammed it through anyway. By the way, the next time there's a financial crash, and there will be a next time coming to a theater near you, uh, you don't have to. They don't have to vote on bailouts. The bailouts are automatic. Of course. So the too yeah, big to so fail doctrine. Yeah, there's 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 no democratic process to it at all. They've got you by the balls. Yeah, I think well, Bush's was called TARP, right? That's the name of the bailout package. Troubled Asset Relief Program. Correct. Yeah. Uh huh. Which Troubled Asset Relief Program is only for the banks and the rich. Right. Not for any of us. And yeah. I also, I remember. Is uh, uh, this is because of the, yeah. This, as this crisis continued, I remember in the very early Obama administration, Rick Santelli went on TV and went on a rant where he's talking about, um, because there was talk of possibly relieving homeowners who had gotten themselves into trouble, and he said, these people are losers. We don't want to pay these losers mortgages. And then the whole floor around him, all these uh, stockbrokers started cheering wildly, like, yeah, fuck those people. But we deserve bailouts because we're the good men. Yeah, well, everybody deserves a bailout, right? I mean, everybody thinks they deserve a bailout, but... But no, this is a this is a crucial. Uh, this entire process is crucial. I mean, you had to get into more of the Obama years with that one, um, because yeah, I believe that the the failure of Obama's first year or two of is naturally is the is the prologue to everything that's come since then, really. Uh, but yeah, no, we, we, it was it was interesting. To, you know, like the. Um, what was interesting about it was uh, what was funny about it was uh, John Stewart. On The Daily Show, because this is really when he gets big is throughout all of this. He has this whole thing where he said that, you know, you, he's like, yeah, yeah, you're just sitting around being like, can Bush screen, is anything else going to get screwed up under Bush? Oh, that's right, the economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Although the economy was somewhat exactly. stagnant-ish the whole time. I mean, not not just even up to the point before the crash. I mean, the, the economy right. was just, a little on the sluggish side the entire presidency. It was, it was. I mean, this is, uh, this is the crash, and he's there for it. He's... In, the, in some ways, the crash is kind of like Hurricane Katrina. It, uh, anybody would put it solely at Bush's feet is just not being broad-minded enough. But ultimately, those kinds of policies were policies that he had supported, were the kinds that led to that, if he, even if he didn't necessarily enact them himself. Right, and of course, he's uh, exactly... If you need a president who's going to change course and detect the problem and try to correct it ahead of time, Bush is probably just about the worst choice for that. Yeah. And if he had been in, he had been a president at a time when protections were in place, such as Glass Steagall, he'd be exactly the kind of guy to go after that as vigorously as possible. So as vigorously as possible. And of course, Glass Steagall, you know, and the our entire banking regulation infrastructure had been gutted. And it's it's interesting. We we had set it up to avoid the Great Depression, so then we got rid of it and got a depression very soon after <laughs> yeah it didn't take long it didn't take long either did it no it really didn't less than 10 years after the repeal of glass steagall you know which in some ways can be kind of overstated other regulations have been taken away too you know but still yeah and <sighs> then we look up north canada have had no major banking crises and yet we still won't just copy paste their laws for banking well, the I thing is, you're why. thinking about the common good. They're not thinking about the common good, you know? <laughs> this is all for the benefit of their class. And for them as individuals in particular. And really, where does this now leave? Um, I mean, at this point, at the end of the Bush administration, where what's his legacy and also where is the country and where is the Republican Party? You know, I mentioned the Republican Party because we talked. I talked a bit about the neocons and how they had uh, gotten in there, and you know, they uh, William F. Buckley had died in two thousand eight. I remember it was early in the year, and Buckley had done a lot to build the conservative movement post World War Two, and you know. It kind of uh, him dying, uh, and particularly him dying at a point when his movement is at its one of its lowest ebbs. Right? There's a, uh, you know, I mean, symbolism might be overstating it, but you get my drift, right? Yeah. There's a, yeah, because Reagan dies at a perfect time to make himself very popular and almost mythological at that very moment. Lincoln, like I always say, dies at exactly the perfect time to make sure he has the highest reputation he can have. In the case of Buckley, it's somebody who gets to die seeing their project unraveling. And uh, despite uh, my own, uh, I don't like Buckley much at all for a variety of reasons, but I do know he was uh, well-spoken and intelligent. I wonder what he was thinking at that point. He had to, Maybe he had to have written something. I mean, his influence had declined quite a bit. You know, the, the real high point of William F. Buckley's influence was the 1980s, honestly. Um, when, by the way, he helped elect Joseph Lieberman. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, yeah, he was a Lieberman fan, you know. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, although, to be fair, Lieberman so, no. was a Democrat who ran openly to the right of the Republican in Connecticut and won. Yeah. Uh, Yes. In the nineteen seventy eight, if I'm not mistaken, but you know, well to be fair, I mean you know, well Buckley in the eighties had um you know, he had he had fought it out with a lot of the more radical libertarians like Murray Rothbard types before. At that point it's really like getting rid of like Rockefeller Republicans, liberal Republicans is the purge of the eighties. And the nineties is gonna be the purge of the paleo conservatives. A lot of purges, you may have noticed, so that by the time you get to Bush you're dealing with an ideologically stagnant movement, which was not before. You know, uh, I mean, I, I already said I didn't like—I don't like the conservative mind by Russell Kirk. I, I don't think it's that well written. I think Kirk's a very muddled thinker. But I can tell he's intelligent. He does very well-read man. 
might be interesting to talk to him. And certainly there are interesting debates happening amongst conservatives at the time. By the time Bush gets elected, that's over. That is long over. You know, the, the days of having a, you know, Buckley, Rothbard, and, and Kirk either trading barbs or exchanging ideas or doing whatever they're doing, those are days are gone. You know? I mean, gone. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So, so we get to the 2008, the Republican Party has gone from you know, uh, achieving the achieving under Bush what it had not enjoyed since the days of Herbert Hoover. Well, I mean, briefly under Eisenhower, you know, to have control of Congress and the presidency. At that point, to realize so many, so much of their dream legislation, if you will. Or Skronik would say George W. Bush was the, um, what was that word he used for them? He's the he's he's art, he's articulating. He's the art, he's articulating the and trying to fulfill the promises of the current political paradigm. He's trying to, in that regard, complete what Reagan began, right? Yeah. And doing so at a time of intellectual stagnation on the right, and at a time when they're in search for an enemy, and then they get one in the form of Iraq, or they get one in the form of terror, right? Which, by the way, it's a pathetic replacement for the Soviet Union. You know, war on terror was never going to have the resonance that the Soviets would have, ever. Couldn't dream to have that. Do you know? Do you know how many tanks in 1985 the Soviet Union had deployed, ready to go over the border? Thirteen thousand. Thirteen thousand. Yeah. You know, by comparison, the war on terror is absolutely pathetic. You know. So anyway, uh, a Republican Party that is now listless, that it's the neoconservatives, interestingly enough, they, they, they achieved power and then lost it rather quickly. And I say lost it, I know they're still on TV and everything, but, and I know they still, the, the, the Republicans who are still in office are people who were influenced by them, so there's still a lot of neoconservative flavor in the Republican Party, but Man, is their influence diminished. I mean, most of them became, uh, I think all of them became never Trumpers, didn't they? Yeah, except for VDH. The rest of them all went uh, anti Trump. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they all became a bunch of never Trumpers, and uh, they, they get to bring them on TV and say, it's okay what you did. And, uh, you know, I'm just thinking that none of these motherfuckers were held responsible for anything. Not no torture, war, Katrina, nothing. And then, Absolutely I mean, nothing. if you look at Bush himself, I mean, he got right now his approval rating among sort of mainstream Democrats is really high, which is insane. How high are you talking? I don't know. I, I remember I, I have heard the number, and it's over 50%, which is crazy. Um, with Among Republicans, it's not very good, though, because uh, right now the Republican Party defines itself on loyalty to Trump. And Bush is clearly a Trump enemy. So, well, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't help that you know the the Republican Party and this this shit could switch again, right? But the Republican Party is taking on more paleo conservative flavors. How serious they are about that, I I have major doubts about, right? But Bush was a neoconservative creature, if you will, and that is not where the party is right now. Now, we can make a case that, hey, you know, if some neoconservative friendly type, let's say, let's say Trump dies. He, you know, one, one McDonald's hamburger too many. He's finally gone, right? And you get somebody in there who is not really like a, a Trump rightist, if you will. And they get in there and they do beat Biden because let's say Biden's like, you know, really screwing up. And by that time he's drooling in public and you know, and taking a dump in public or whatever the fuck else, right? And you yeah. can't make excuses for them anymore. And yeah, that could happen. And they 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 could they could possibly go back to neoconservatism. And yeah, this this democratic like Bush is okay. Why? Because he hated Trump. I mean, this is like some friend enemy distinction stuff here. Yeah, that's literally all it was. Basically, uh, Bush spoke out against Trump's rhetoric, and also he he let himself be quoted as saying after. Trump's inauguration, that was some weird fucking shit. And then, of course, he struggled with his uh, rain thing, and uh, even though it was just him being clumsy, 
later on he tried to play it up as, yeah, see, I'm doing my resistance by drawing attention away <laughs> from the orange man. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's kind of what was happening. It, it, Bush you, knew that this would be an opening because everybody decided that Trump, well, everybody in the media, on the, uh, the liberal media, decided that Trump was like Satan, effectively. And so Bush decided to go cultivate the friendship and uh, admiration of people who had always hated him. And then he basically got a full pardon just for not being Trump. And because his brother yeah, had been Trump's chief antagonist in the primary. I have to say, though, that was uh, that was going to kind of happen anyway, though. Bush Bush genuinely saw himself as a compassionate conservative. Remember the Kanye West rant about George W. Bush doesn't care about black people during Katrina? Yeah, which is actually probably the most coherent of the Kanye West rants. It's one of the better ones. I... It, Kanye, uh, I'll say that his his sentiments were felt in New Orleans, and we were mostly in agreement. You know, but you know, but uh, yeah, sorry, Katrina's tough. Um, Kanye West, though, with that one, apparently that really hurt Bush. Bush genuinely did see himself as a compassionate conservative. And think about this, too. Was Bush really trying to repeal the welfare state? No, he expanded it Medicare Part D. Social Security was essentially a way for him to have it both ways. You can keep uh, this New Deal policy that's popular with people who increasingly vote for you, while at the same time, you know, getting your uh, your your, uh, your criminal friends on Wall Street rich, right? It's an attempt to have it both ways. You yeah. Know, so, I, I in other words, like the rehabilitation of Bush doesn't entirely shock me, especially as the Democratic Party. It doesn't. They they don't campaign on I'm going to repeal surveillance anymore, do they? Hell no. Nope. They, they don't talk about it. it at all. Nope. They want to expand it. The the the, the critique amongst lots of Democrats that Trump wasn't aggressive enough in his foreign policy. Well, neoconservatives are tailor made to have all sorts of solutions for you. Now, whether or not that means a Democrat's going to invade, I don't know because lots of Democrats still are you know upset about Bush and are. Uh, generally non-interventionist. But I'm just saying that it it's kind of disgusting and it makes you think, like, was all that opposition in the aughts, was that just opportunism? There was nothing genuine there? That was just, we see a political opportunity? I, I guess it was. I was very upset in 2007 when the Democrats get elected on a mandate called Get the Fuck Out of Iraq and they refused to do it. They refused to press the issue. Yeah. And that was what that election was about, too. And and also, even 2008, a lot of the issue was we really want to leave Iraq. We're going to leave Iraq, and I, somebody was pointing that earlier. You know, if you look at it, both Trump and Obama are sent in as reform candidates, like, fix this shit, okay? They don't, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, they're going to do some... They're going to do some things, especially Obama. So I'm not here to... I mean, you know, his... Dodd Frank, while weaker than I would have liked, was something. Okay, you know, I will. You know, it it it, it, it was something, right? I, I'm not gonna totally like, um, you know, what's that little cliche like? Uh, don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Yeah, which was basically the motto of the Obama administration. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but the yeah. that kind that kind of sweeping reforms just uh, didn't occur. But yeah, no. It was, it, the end of Bush administration, the Republican Party's in shambles. The neoconservatives are very weak. Now the Republicans are going to be a party in search of something afterwards. They're going to flirt with libertarianism for a little while, you know, but that don't go anywhere. Uh, you know, and what would be Bush's legacy then, you think? Well... Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like Bush brought neoconservatism to the fore as its chief proponent. I mean, clearly not its chief intellectual proponent, but as its chief executioner, I guess you could say. Really, largely discredited it in many ways because of his failures. So I guess that's part of his legacy. Um, he both created, well, he rode that Clinton wave, the Clinton era wave of Republicans are better on defense, and then he proved that to be a lie because, again, of his handling of the war on terror. 
Um, let's see. He destroy. He, he inherited a pretty good situation overall because basically he had a lot of freedom coming in the office. There was a there wasn't a major crisis. There was a surplus. Even though he did still have a little bit of heat from the 2000 election, he had a pretty easy ride early on. He could have done a lot of things. He could have just ridden out prosperity and not done shit. That was also an option. I mean, even though it would have been a boring presidency and it wouldn't have created a legacy, that would be better than what he ended up doing. But he didn't even do that. He tried to just do tax cuts, the regulations, and play golf. He didn't really want to do any serious governing or even dealing with foreign policy at all. He actually had an almost complete disinterest in foreign policy up until 9-11. Then he, this attack happens under his watch, and it was largely his fault. Then he manages to basically get credit for responding to it, becomes a national hero for a little bit, and then uses that cred to get us into Iraq. That becomes a fucking disaster. And then we're there for 20 years. Well, there, well, Afghanistan for 20 years, Iraq for like 15. And says his foreign policy legacy, he really discredits the idea of America as a force for good in the world. So a lot of the goodwill that we have after the Cold War is fucked. So that's great. Um, domestically, he does, he basically continues a lot of Clinton's deregulations and deepens them. He also is anti-environment, which is something we haven't emphasized enough. His EPA director, he basically elect, he basically chooses people who are absolute jokes and won't do anything. Um, yeah. So there's that. He's in favor of offshore drilling, and I want to say that uh, big oil disaster that happened off the Gulf Coast. I, that might have been early Obama, technically, but it's based on Bush era policy because Bush is the one who is really opened shit era. up. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're 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 correct about that. Uh, that was a bad one too, in many ways, for Obama. But no, the uh, all of this is true. We didn't, uh, yeah, we we didn't even really get into the environment stuff. Fucking terrible. Although, yeah, Bush is probably like the worst modern president on the environment of all of them that we talked about, and probably worse than Trump too. Why? Because Trump didn't get to do much. <laughs> yeah, because Trump didn't do that much. Exactly. And Bush was anti-stem cell, somebody just pointed out in the chat. I remember that being a thing, too, because a lot of religious people were, thought you had to murder babies to get stem cells. So yeah. Bush was against that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's... Like I said, I, the only thing I could... I, I remember when there's that top ten list by Simon Whistler, who's one of the shittiest hosts on all YouTube, talking about the ten awesome things George W. Bush did... Literally six of them are basically that he gave foreign aid to countries in Africa. Just phrased differently, though. So, yeah, <laughs> if you're trying to do a list of ten things about Bush that were awesome, it's going to be a really hard list. And most of the things that he does come up with are things that literally would be guaranteed to happen under any American president at that time. So, the foreign aid to West Africa, this is because the Cold War's over, one, and then two... After 2000, the uh, most West African countries become democratic. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what that was the big holdout. That was the big obstacle to giving foreign aid in the Clinton years. And basically, both parties agreed as soon as these countries go democratic, they get foreign aid. Guess what happens all right around 2000? Bush gives a bunch of foreign aid at that time. Yeah, not, there wasn't a debate over that. It was just something that happened. But then uh, in that Simon Whistler video, he's like, yeah, man, Bush was a great president. He did all these cool things. I'm like, yeah, everything you just listed is something that literally would happen under any other president. Yeah. So anyway, I, I don't know. Bush, to me, Bush is a bottom five president of all time. Um, I don't know exactly where I'd rank him. He's not as bad as Buchanan, obviously. But he is the worst president of my lifetime, and my lifetime has had only bad presidents. Yeah, I guess he's not as bad as Buchanan. That's probably true, but definitely worst in my lifetime as well. Um, and yeah, some people might say some of this is, you know, being in college when Bush is president. Like people will be like, oh, Nixon was the worst because they were in college. But 
No, I, 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 I think I can give like very, very tangible reasons for that, you know, and um, I, I strain to think of anything that was done well. I think a lot of the worst trends in America were simply accelerated. Yeah, I think and you're right. Obama really becomes the first president that when I was alive where they get elected with the idea of you have to clean up somebody else's mess. You know, I mean, nobody had been elected with that kind of idea since Reagan. Yeah, and the irony, of course, is that when Bush got elected, he said, one thing I'm going to do is really clean up the White House. I mean, Bill Clinton sullied it with his adultery. I'm going to make Americans proud of their president again. Yeah, that's, that's a bad it, sign. Yeah, that uh, then it really happened, did it? Yeah, Nixon's the same like that too. Yeah, you know? no. Anytime you anytime you come up with that kind of a promise, uh, be warned, something's about to happen, and it's not going to be good. That that was the other thing too. That's the, okay. That I was trying to strain to remember. There's one other thing not spoken of too much, but should be with Bush, and this is another massive foreign policy failure. His shift to the Middle East is to the benefit of Russia and China. And the stronger position that both countries now have is in part due to that, especially in the case of China. The idea in China was that they now had breathing room. Because remember, that if people, people forget this, but tensions with China were kind of high in Bush's first year. And there was the anticipation that that was going to be, I wouldn't say the new Cold War, but we were going to have what Obama would later term that pivot to Asia, right? Right. And there were lots of scare articles and magazines about China and like the size of their military. And at that time, certain improvements were made to their military. And then there was um, an incident with a fighter aircraft, I believe. And it just, it, there was, and then 9-11 happened. And literally the Chinese were like, they, they breathed a sigh of relief and said, we must use this period to strengthen ourselves. And when you look at China's position, their trade position, and all the rest, it vastly improves in the Bush years. This is also when they get good at stealing our stuff. Oh, yeah. Also, CAFTA, I think, was like 2006, right? The Central American Free Trade Arrangement or Agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, Bush, yeah, we lost a lot of ground vis-a-vis -vis China. This is really when those estimates start to say, actually, China will overtake us sooner than we used to think. It'll actually be closer to 2020 rather than 2030 or 2040. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, uh, yeah. The, uh, America, if you really, th if that's the thing too, that this is where the tragedy is. And the tragedy is that America and, you know, the liberal democracy that we epitomized stands almost unchallenged after the Cold War. And so much of that prestige is wasted on a completely needless war in Iraq. Yeah. I don't know what else is heartbreaking. What's what else? What, uh, what else is more heartbreaking, really? I mean, to, to a certain degree, I mean, this has been used as a talking point by the Democrats, but it actually is 100% accurate, which is pretty rare for any political talking point. But basically, Bush came in, things were favorable. He had a lot of opportunities to do whatever he wanted, no real crises. And when he leaves, America is a smoldering ruin. <laughs> I mean, what else do you need to say? That That's the presidency of George W. Bush in a nutshell. This guy failed on almost every fucking level. It, it's way easier to list his failures than it is his successes. I mean, if I, if I were doing top ten list of Bush failures, I could make an entire fucking channel about that. I could probably get 10 top 10s of Bush failures. But if I was trying to do a top 10 Bush accomplishments, I don't think I could do it. I don't think it's possible. You know, it's the other one, though, too, now that, now that you mention it. Um, there is... America... America's in a weird spot, 90s and then into the aughts. It's held together by military and economic power, really, and prestige. But as a coherent society, it's lost a lot of that for a number of reasons. I don't want to get into, but in other words, the, it doesn't, the, 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 the social cohesion is wearing thin for a lot of reasons that, uh, you know, involving uh, economics, 
um, you know, the um, kind of uh, decaying of the American culture, if you will, uh, and society. And what was the other one to do with this? You know, just also, I mean, if if, if we think about America before, it had been uh, it, it it really been this uh, majority white Protestant nation. That kind of cohesion is going away. Americans' identity of who they are is getting weaker, actually. You know, but the faith can be maintained because hey, we've conquered, we've, we've outlasted the Soviets, and our military and economic might proves our superiority. That's gone at the end of Bush's two terms. Right. And they're in, and you know, Obama's supposed to come in here and save this thing, restore America's prestige, deal with an economic crisis. And while we don't want anybody getting invaded, we would at least like our military to be competent. And we'll get into that with Obama, but I believe that Obama's failure to rescue that situation in turn, along with the fact that social cohesion and faith in the country has taken major hits, means that very quickly that uh, ideal of liberal democracy uh, starts to die away, which is really kind of sad, you know, if you think about it. The, Liberal democracy had, had, had slayed the monarchies, the Nazis, fascists, and the commies, only to be laid low and crushed <laughs> at its mo- shortly after its moment of ultimate triumph, right? Yeah. Because there's one thing that I think defines what's going on right now is the, I wouldn't even call it slow necessarily. Historically, it's a fairly swift death of liberalism. And I, I don't really see liberalism making any comeback in my future. You know, what, what underpinned it is, is gone. And, you know, if, if the critics of liberalism were right about anything, it's that it does make people atomized. It also makes them just atomized consumers. Yeah. You know, and atomized people do want to search for a higher meaning in the end. So all I could pin it together was militarism and capitalism, and both of those took big, big hits under Bush. Yeah, in many ways, I feel like the world since Bush, uh, the Republicans have never really regained any sort of balance or any sort of purpose. Because, I mean, the Trump movement, if we really think about it, it's a movement centered around one man, and he's an obese old man. This is not a stable movement, just by definition. It's I not think sustainable it's, uh, or coherent. No, no, no. no. I, I disagree with you on that one. I think this is uh, sustainable. Uh, if they get somebody who can take over uh, in Trump's place, you know, um, you know. Also, everybody always talks about him being fat. He's not that fat, really. Well, okay, here's here's the reason why I always point that out, though. Because one time he had to do a physical and it, he had to have his doctor go out there and talk about, like, how he's not fat or whatever. And he apparently the way he had it done is his doctor announced him at a weight that was literally one pound below obese. And I'm like, okay, that seems really suspicious, especially because they keep emphasizing that he's not over that limit. <laughs> okay, because 240 for his height would be considered obese. He was 239. I'm going to guess his actual weight was like 245. But, <laughs> I don't know, because it just seemed way too forced and fake. And, yeah, anyway. Not an important point, but I just find it funny. I got you, I got you. No, I, well, I, I think you're right that they've uh, they've really been off balance. Um Trumpism, if you will, or the Steven Saylor strategy, if you want to put it that way, I think does have legs. I'm not sure how long it goes on, necessarily. Uh, could the Republican Party return to neoconservatism? Sure. I have serious doubts, though. I don't think they I would think, do that. Uh, yeah, I don't think they do it either. And also, socially, the, the, uh, the neoconservatives ultimately are yeah, intellectually shallow, hollow, and... Um, they don't have a social base. Like I said, you know, it, 
Say what one will about the uh, multicultural identity, woke left, whatever word you want to use for it. It does have uh, more of a social base than the neoconservatives ever enjoyed. Yeah, but and also to I, be fair um, with the neocons, the whole thing too is that they kind of glommed on to other movements that got them elected. Because if they just came out strictly as neocons with nothing else going on, they're not going to win. Well, in that regard, we've come full circle. So you're agreeing with Pat Buchanan that they are the fleas on the conservative dog. Yeah, I mean, they are. I mean, because if you, if you, like we've said on many occasions, people don't vote on foreign policy. Um, <laughs> look, and that's what the neocons are fundamentally about. So there's no way for a foreign policy centered movement to get elected without glomming on to something that's more popular, something that people get more fired up about in their hearts. Whether that's social conservatism or libertarianism even, if you could find some version of it that actually has mass appeal or uh, like the America First kind of rhetoric, whatever it might be, you have to glom on to something else that actually gets people worked up. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's funny. It's funny. The neoconservatives really couldn't fully. Yeah, I guess a Tea Party. We'll have to talk about that when we get there, you know. Uh, but all that being said, uh, I think uh, one way to end this one is with the best painting of Bush I know of. I'm going to pull this one up. It was apparently found in Jeffrey Epstein's Rape Island. What? <laughs> and it's a painting of George W. Bush playing with paper airplanes. Oh my God. Depending on what this looks like, it might end up being our thumbnail. Let's see. What the fuck? Well, I mean, to be fair, that actually captures the essence of George W. Bush better than any other image I've ever seen in my life. Yeah? Yeah, that's, that's Bush. In a nutshell. <laughs> Also, another interesting thing about Bush, and I think about it, remember how he and Karl Rove supposedly had a competitive reading club where the two of them competed to read the most books? No, I didn't know about this. Yeah, so this is clearly not true, but, but it was designed to try to counteract the image of Bush as anti-intellectual. And supposedly he was really into reading about history, and especially Genghis Khan, which coincidentally, Genghis Khan's also a big favorite of Bill Clinton. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, these these men in power, I mean, you know, Genghis Khan is like the patron saint of the powerful, right? Of, yeah. Like total power. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I've, I've, I love that painting. So you want to make that painting the... Uh, the uh... Yeah, that's our new thumbnail <laughs> from this point forward. That's it's got to be. There that's too perfect. <laughs> I didn't know this existed, but... God damn. Oh, yeah, it's great. I fucking love it, man. No, um, it is. Like, yeah, my... I mean, yeah, he was like a kid playing with blocks and you can hear that in those calls that were leaked where he's talking with his advisors i mean he's got a very childlike understanding of these wars that he's conducting as the commander-in-chief mm. and also he only really ever had one effective speech writer and that was the guy who joined them after 9-11 but then kind of left because like yeah i'm not really like a republican or especially not this kind of republican so i'm gonna peace out i was just here for the national unity thing i'm gonna leave now but he had one person who understood you can only use monosyllabic words because if you keep it really simple with Bush, he can actually be fairly effective. Yeah, it's funny, too. We've really – not that, like, Reagan, Bush Sr., and Bill Clinton were, like, using big words. But Bush, Obama, and Trump, I mean, we really – each one of them, we really saw a decline in the language used. And I always say that about Obama. and People go, like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, no, he's, a, he, he's great at delivering speeches. The actual words are real simple. Okay. Yeah, because I remember so they did a they did the language survey of different candidates, and they said they said that one of the problems with Bernie in 2016 is that he uses too many big words, and they said he's speaking at a 10th grade level. I'm like, how the hell is that too many big words? And then I looked at the levels for a lot of the other candidates, and they were between fourth and sixth grade. Yeah, I want to say Obama was sixth grade level. Sounds about right. Line. And Trump was like fifth grade or something. Which makes me wonder, who's fourth grade? Or maybe Trump was fourth grade. Anyway, 
I just know, like, it's been a degradation. I wonder where Biden's at. Kindergarten? <laughs> I don't know, but uh, Rick Perry was really low on that, too. Oh, God, that's a great one, man. <laughs> yeah, no, Rick Perry, I remember um, he was Bush's successor as governor of Texas. They hate each other personally, but they're basically the same in terms of what they did in Texas. And then Perry tried to run for basically a third Bush term in 2012. And I remember the yeah. cracks about when he got glasses to try to make himself look smarter going into the primary cycle. Because everybody was saying, yeah, dude, you, you can't just go to Lens Crafters and boost your IQ. And then he, <laughs> he famously just fucked up uh, when he was asked what he was planning to cut from the government. It was funny, too, because when he first came in, he was polling high. He was getting lots of money. And then uh, I've rarely seen somebody in a nomination uh, contest crash and burn that bad, you know? Well, part of it was there was a lot of instability in the party because they knew they had a chance to win after the 2010 midterms against Obama, and they were still trying to figure out where we go from Bush. So I think there was a lot of instability in terms of where voters wanted to put their support because, as we talked about, I mean, the failure of Bush not only affected Republican leadership but also just base Republicans. Like, what the fuck do we do now? And uh, that, I think you see that in the instability of the 2012 cycle where you had all these candidates rising and falling rapidly. Um, we have, um, like what Michelle Bachman led at one point. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I think did, yeah. Herman Cain surged to the top at one point. I mean, they, they were going through these candidates, like maybe this direction, maybe this person, I don't know. So it was pretty crazy how unstable the party was after Bush. And I think that's maybe part of why they've latched on the Trump as hard as they have as a savior figure, because he made them relevant again, one, but also he gave them a leader that they had been lacking so badly for over a decade. Because just being anti-Obama, that's just what you're against. That doesn't really define what you're for. Mm -hmm. And uh, To be I, fair, of course, the same end of things, the, uh, the Democrats' uh, 2020 primary fight was also very, very turbulent and in flux as well. It was, um, although to be fair, I mean... It, because I mean, I'm obviously neither of us are Obama fans, but Obama didn't leave office in complete disgrace. So you can have discussions about how to succeed Obama. You can mention his name. If if you're in a Republican primary in 2012 or 2016, it's best just to leave the Bush name untouched as much as possible, unless you're attacking Jeb for his brother. <laughs> That is a good point, but I think the 2021 for the Democrats had more to do with the weakness of a lot of candidates, you know, uh, which I mean, is true of 2012 for the Republicans as well. But yeah, candidate weakness those huge fields have so many weak candidates. I mean, I remember the 2012 Republicans, if I'd been still doing YouTube at the time, because that was during a period where I'd quit. Dude, I'd have had so much fodder back then because there some all those candidates were fascinating. It was like the the biggest freak show of a primary I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> but all right, sir, I think we should probably call it quits. I still got uh, work in the morning and whatnot. I know that I will not be doing anything next week because it's Halloween, but if you want to do Dune in two weeks, I'm down. And I know Obama next month. I've got a few uh, books to read. Yeah, so um, to, uh, I'm thinking for the Halloween episode... Assuming that my schedule works out for this, what I'd like to do is First Punic War from the Carthaginian perspective. So That sounds cool. Yeah, so that'll probably be this coming week, Halloween. I, I'm not 100% on that yet. I'll have to confirm midweek, but if you're interested in that, let me know, and I will see if I can make that happen. Probably You're try to do a tier insane, ranking of the Carthaginian yeah. generals, although there's not a ton on most of them, so it probably won't be a super long stream. I will say, to be honest about Halloween, the chance that I'll be on with you is probably like one, maybe two percent. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of the biggest nights in the French Quarter. Friends will be out. I'm just I'm gonna want to be out, you know. So, um, but you never know, man. Maybe 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 I'll injure my leg or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody, somebody said earlier they're speculating that you were late because you got shot for selling Lucy's. <laughs> That's part of my time management failure, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, we'll, uh, 
So uh, next month, um, you'd like to do Dune and Obama. And if you want to, I, I, I'm i actually reading a book on D-Day next month if you want to talk about that randomly. Uh, perhaps. You know, um, well, we could, oh, God, we could compare amphibious operations then, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like comparing amphibious operations, like, was there anything D-Day-esque in the ancient world? Not especially, no. I mean, I'm not talking about, like, fortified positions with guys, like, you know, throwing javelins at you while you land on a beach, right? Well, actually, Caesar's Landing in Britain, I think, was like that, and I think about it. And then... In Sicily, there was that danger when the Athenians attacked. There was also the operation at Pylos, where the Athenians landed men to deal with the Spartans on the island as Facteria. So yeah, actually there are a few amphibious assaults, and I think about it. Yeah, if you want to do, um, uh, if you want to do, uh, if you want to do one of those too, you know, in the American Civil War, there's really nothing quite, quite like it. I mean, if the Union does an amphibious movement, they're 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 not going to land anywhere. That's they're going to land away from where there's like cannons and whatnot. And yeah. um, although probably the biggest the biggest amphibious operation of the Civil War is Bermuda Hundred campaign because um, you know they land they land about thirty eight thousand troops in one day along the James River, mostly Bermuda Hundred itself. Uh, I don't know of any other landing of troops that's that scale in the Civil War, but they aren't. They aren't. They're landed in, in areas where the only thing they're going to run into is like Confederate scouts and signalmen. Like at Bermuda Hundred itself, I think they ran like three Confederates like fishing. Oh, you man. know, <laughs> they did, they captured their they captured their fish. You know, they fled from their boat and they like, hey, look, fish sticks. You know. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Well, sir, I conclude this by saying on my just concluding on my end. Uh, this has been one of the most depressing streams I've done with you. Yeah, I, I mean, there really to... weren't any bright spots. It's not like, and also during this time, some uh, cool thing happened randomly. Also, the aughts. I mean, the only thing that the aughts were good for culturally, just as a quick side note, uh, comedy was really good at this time. Partly it's because I think Bush is the perfect comedy president because he's ridiculous enough that it's obvious how to make fun of him. But he doesn't give you too much material to work with. He gives you just enough. Yeah, you know, I think if I was, uh, if I, if I was thinking back, and you know, I'd love to one time do some stuff where we just talk about the culture of each decade. I know we did something like that before, but you know, really just to be like, oh, this and that, you know. But uh, in the aughts, the only two things I remember being bright spots was uh, dramatic television. You know. Uh, some of those shows, of course, had really shitty endings like Lost and Battlestar Galactica. But other ones like, you know, The Wire uh, is one of the greatest shows ever made. Rome's excellent, as you know. So you, uh, Sopranos was big at this time as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, TV so starts had... getting good at this time. Uh, so, I mean, there are things that happen, especially toward the end. But for the most part, I mean, this isn't like a great decade for culture. I guess also toward the end of the Bush years, you also start to get some really good games around 2006 and seven. There's a glut of really good IPs that start coming out for the first time. Uh, Mass Effect, among yes. others. Yes, I started getting very optimistic about video games. Anyway, that's over. Uh, the thing I actually miss most from the aughts, though, would be the internet. The internet was much better in the aughts. Uh, it was... You're still in your Wild West phase, so there's anything goes mentality in a lot of places, but um, the internet also... This is the height of people being very positive of the internet, but that's also because it's new stuff, right? So if you if you didn't grow up with, say, Facebook, well, suddenly you have this way to actually, yes, connect with people who you maybe haven't seen in a while. And, yeah. And you know, the, the, the mentality about the internet was just much, much more positive at this time. Uh, and it was, you know, it's funny. It was crazy. It was good stuff. I mean, you get to see things like YouTube getting born, as we're using our right now and uh the aughts internet i do really really miss a lot um somewhere around 2012 or 13 the internet started getting a little dicier in some ways but i'd say 2016 is really where it went right straight down the shitter yes i, I mean, agree it was 
It was already trimmed in that way, but it's kind of like, you know, when you flush a toilet, is that part where it's really spiraling downwards, you know? Yeah, no, I, uh, actually, it's interesting, that's 2016, that's about exactly when I really gave up on Facebook. I still have it technically, just so I can use Messenger to talk to people, but I don't really use it anymore just because it's become so fucking toxic and ridiculous. I just, I don't want to see any of that bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, I... I was kind of, I started really reducing my usage in 2016 was when I started reducing. And then last year, um, shortly after the pandemic started, I just deactivated the fucker. You know, I mean, I can, I still have the messenger app on my phone, but I'm never, I'm never going back. I have no interest. And what's funny is, and I wasn't even using Facebook that much, but once I deactivated it, I just was getting so much more done in my life. Oh, really? Like, well, yeah, I mean, the thing, well, it was funny, though, because it wasn't like I was spending hours on Facebook, but I think I know what it was. Like, you'd go on Facebook, and I might post something or look at a few things, and that takes a bit of minutes out of you, but it also changes your mentality. And I found that Facebook was essentially making me, like, uh, in some ways mentally twitchy and weird. Because, hmm. you know, you're constantly like, what's new, what's new, what's new sort of thing, even if you're even if you're not using it that much, Right. And I just could feel my brain calming down when it was deactivated. Huh. You could just feel it. You know? Interesting. So all I use is Instagram because I do like pictures. You know? I've never and used IG. Sometimes people, I mean, like, but I don't get wrapped up in it because, you know, people get wrapped up in it and it's like, oh, I did this to get many likes. And I'm just like... Well, yeah, I mean, like, for instance, like, attractive women I know who will have something like, this didn't get a lot of likes. I'm like, I know, you didn't show off your body. That's what these creepers <laughs> want, you know? Yeah. You know this, I know, right? I don't give a shit about thumbs. I just post what I like, and if other people happen to thumb it, I'm like, nice, that's fine, great, whatever. It's cool, you know? You got a comment for me? That's good. Well, I just, Twitter. Twitter's one I don't look, really I, get. Uh, like, Twitter, I have friends who have Twitter accounts, and I've seen them post, like, seven or eight things in a row without any reaction from anyone. And they just keep posting shit. I'm like, what's the point of this? Yeah, God. Twitter, when I when I heard about the character limits for Twitter, I was immediately like, I have no interest in this thing. I never want to go there. And to be honest, I'll be fair to Twitter th about this, though. When I first heard about it, I thought it was going to become a dumpster fire sooner than it took. You know? But I now consider Twitter the worst thing on the internet. And, you know, Jack Dorsey, If I mean, if... If he falls in a vat of acid, good on him. Couldn't happen to a worse person. Uh, if Twitter were to fail, I would get drunk that night in celebration. I think Twitter has been one of the worst things for humanity of the last 10 years. I think oh. it's really fucked people's heads. Also, so here's the thing. Uh, I know it probably sounds classless to say, but whenever George W. Bush eventually does die, I'm not only getting drunk, I'm throwing a party. <laughs> I'm inviting everyone. That might be the one time I go back on the Facebook and have like an open invitation for all my friends to come over and get trashed. Um, or I might just go out to a local bar and be like, uh, round of shots on me, George W. Bush is dead. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Um... I've hated yeah, the man I, my not, entire adult I, life. He's a fucking, uh, he's a fucking sore on the ass of America. His presidency is a disgrace. He's a disgrace. His legacy is yeah. almost entirely negative. I mean, this man literally made America worse. America is Quite worse right. for having had him as president in demonstrable I feel ways. Like, I think though, like it's kind of like. Um... But one thing I think is I, I I think I'll just feel just a kind of nothing on my end. Like I, when Rumsfeld died, I was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I I I guess nothing because I reach into the stream and I just my feeling on Bush ultimately is a feeling of exhaustion and um, kind of resignation too. You know, because I can remember 
writing and even thinking at the time, especially when Obama gets elected, we could reverse the course. We might be able to like save something here. And it, you know, that didn't turn out to be the case. So I, it's almost like how I look at, look at Bush and I go like, well, that occurred. It's fucking horrible. But at this point, everything's been normalized with it, including the man himself. Right. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. So I just, I think of Bush, I just got this hollow feeling, mm. you know, uh, you know, and also it doesn't help that he's just like a dumb, empty vessel. Yeah, you know? he's really he's more the symbol of a movement rather than really the architect. But still, he is the one guy who brought it all together. And they needed someone with a decent amount of charisma to go out there and sell this bullshit. Bush was their vessel, as you said. But without him, they don't get to do what they did. <laughs> Well, before I go, I'll I mention two uh, two things. Uh, Jaybird said Sean likes the IG models. Lol. No, that's just a few friends of mine. I <laughs> they're just the kind. They're just the kind of people who are like looking for like they they're they're the kind of people who are, who will be like, yes, I am a narcissistic millennial. You know. Yeah, here are but, my eighty-seven um, selfies from today. You know. <laughs> um. Uh, but yeah, Zach says, I still weep for Napoleon. And I just want you to know, Zach, I do too. All right. When <laughs> people are like, you know, like, 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 who are you to like, 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 who's your return to King situation? Like, I'm like, Napoleon. I mean, you kidding me? I love the hundred days. I mean, not the whole part where a bunch of people die horribly at Waterloo for nothing and everything gets blown to pieces, but you know, the entire conquest of France that he does in 1815 I think it's one of the most. I think it's one of, if not the most brilliant military campaign ever. How many dudes you know just roll in and conquer a country without killing anybody? I mean, not many. It completely insane. It, it's it's got it's, it's it's so like the fucking high point of this thing, you know. And as Jay Bird also says, Bush is somehow to blame for the end of the Attitude Era in wrestling. I just want to know your thoughts on that before we go. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it, to a certain extent. He might have actually been in the sense that there was, because of Bush being a moralizing prick, and then because of 9-11 happening, there was pressure by the networks on WWE to tone it down. And so they transitioned into the ruthless aggression era right after they had a WrestleMania with Rock versus Austin. So right as the Attitude Era really peaked, then it ended pretty suddenly. And they couldn't really do a lot of the same things they've been doing. So, but I think it would have ended eventually. Yeah, anyway. I'll say this though. I'll say this though. I think the Attitude Era, like they were like, I know what you're talking about it ending, and I wasn't watching too much or anything, but I do feel like, of course, the um, the fingerprints of it were still there throughout the Bush years, but now it's really totally gone. Yeah, no, and part of it's because a lot of the same stars of the Attitude Era were still around, because those are mostly the Gen X wrestlers. And most of those guys yeah, lasted yeah. until about 2010 to 15 or so. So there were still enough guys around to, bring, to sort of bring the Attitude. There are actually still a handful of those guys around now, but uh, they were the guys who were really young at, back then and are at the end of their career now. And one of them, Chris Jericho, he's become a fucking living parody of what he once was. Because <laughs> he used to be like the sleek, athletic oh. guy, but now he's just fat and looks like fucking Baron Harkonnen. <laughs> and it's, it's it's not a character he's doing. He's literally just having a midlife crisis on television. So anyway, so wait, wait. But which Baron Harkonnen does he look like? Um, Nineteen eighty four or twenty twenty one? Probably a little bit more eighty four. I would say. That's great. So he's got the fucking, he got the warts on his face. He doesn't everything. have any warts on his face. It's just like he's just kind of bloated and looks like shit, doesn't really move very well. And he gets winded after every move. So his matches are, he tries to do fast matches, but he can't because that's what he used to do. And he can't, oh doesn't know how to do it now because he doesn't have the steam. And then when he fucks up half his moves because he's just not in shape. Uh, anyway. Yeah, but also it's funny, though, because a lot you know, of guys actually, his age, that's... because of modern training and exercise and diet and shit, there are a lot of guys his age, about 50 or whatever, who are still in really, really good shape. And then Jericho's out there full-time wrestling and looks like fucking shit. 
<laughs> yeah, speaking of wrestlers, I mean, the, uh, they got what's his name to play the Count Raban, uh, fucking Batista. Yeah, pretty good choice. Oh, great choice, man! He had the he had the presence. He had the voice and the presence. Yeah, the... uh, I know. I know he wasn't in it much, but when he was in it, I was like, "Yep, that's Raban." You know? No, yeah, they, fact, they nailed they hired that. Him, I was like, "Yeah." Another one who could have worked yeah, in that he... role would be the Beast Brock Lesnar. He's already got yeah, the right nickname, that. and not only that, but he's also just a big hulking guy who doesn't seem like he has any mercy. Uh quick. No, one last question, sorry. Uh, uh, what effect did uh, Chris Benoit, the Chris Benoit, you know, murder and murders and death, uh, and suicide, I mean, uh, have on uh, wrestling in particular? Well, the Attitude Era had already been over for like three years. Um, it didn't At really... Least. Yeah, so I don't think it really had a huge impact on wrestling as a whole. I know it impacted all the wrestlers personally because they all knew him. A lot of them were very close friends with him, but um, it made a lot of people think more carefully about head trauma. In terms of yeah. how they presented or anything else, I don't think it really had an impact because no one blamed it on, say, storylines or anything like that. Yeah, so the, the impact is not easily measurable. But in terms of public perception of wrestling, I think that it did really spotlight how wrestling will fuck you up. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's what I thought too. And also coming around the same time with the NFL stuff as well. Although I leave you with uh, one of the most tasteless shirts I'd ever seen. It was it just had Chris Benoit's face in the shirt and it said underneath it, I'd kill it. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, um, and also, uh, I guess, speaking of tasteless ads or shirts. I remember right after Bush left office, there was that famous billboard somebody, some commerce group put up of him waving as he's walking into a building that says, Miss Me Yet? And I remember the universal response right after he left office was, Nope. Yeah, I remember seeing that thing and um, and such. I wonder, you know, I, I know I keep saying last stuff, you know, I keep having thoughts that you know, I, I've seen the Nixon reputation fluctuate a lot as well. Like, Nixon had something of a little revival in the Bush years because people were like, remember when Republicans could do diplomacy? You yeah. Know? Remember when Republicans oh. could read? <laughs> yes. So, remember when Republicans drank? Because, you know, Nixon was a drinker. <laughs> yeah, and then Bush is a dry drunk. Uh. Yeah, but, you know, it's just like... Um, but no, I mean, it's like, you know, he, um, I, I, I wonder what other fluctuations there'll be. Because Nixon's reputation then really went down in the Trump years, partially because of Roger Stone, but also just like, uh, you know, this idea of like, oh, our president's at war with the media and, uh, and uh, you know, other, other you know, and, and he's going to be scandal ridden too, you know. So, you know, Nixon, I, I, I saw Nixon being propped up as a, you know, he, he, I mean, Watergate was messed up, but otherwise he was decent into what it is right now, you know, which is Nixon's on the, really on the low end again. And I just wonder if that'll be the case with Bush as well, where he'll have a, a reputation that seems to fluctuate. I don't know. Way. I mean, I, I feel like if you just look at his accomplishments as a whole, well, accomplishments in quotes, it's, yeah, I don't see how you can, how he can really <laughs> escape the middle I mean, I, I, I can see somebody trying to defend him and getting him into the middle, but I can't see anybody trying to put him higher than that without really engaging in hackery of the worst kind. Uh, because after that point, it, you just have to be lying about his achievements. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's got to be bottom of the barrel. I, know, I think the official rankings, which tend to be a little too kind to him, have him, what, around 6th or 7th worst? Or maybe even tenth, I don't know, but uh, yeah, he's he doesn't do well. And even though those rankings are way too kind, he should be about second or third worst. I see. Well, you know, you know, you know, he might turn into for these people though, uh, the equivalent of a kind of like Grover Cleveland, where you're like, where they're essentially it's along the lines of, we think he was a decent man, but a terrible president. Yeah, I think he was a terrible man and even worse president, but 
<laughs> so not the equivalent of Grover Cleveland. Do you ever want to do the Grover Cleveland deep dive? Let me know. I'll you know try to get some stuff. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do that sometime. I'll have to read up on Grover. I don't know much about him. I actually am planning on reading up on Franklin Pierce if you want to do that sometime. Yeah, so another one of those guys chasing the bottom. <laughs> oh god, yeah, we'll have like about twelve people. Well, they'll have more than twelve. Come on, all the, oh, come on, all the Franklin Pierce fans will come out, right? <laughs> yeah, Pierce Nation. Pierce Nation. Well, all right, sir. So you want to do Dune in two weeks? Yeah, Dune in two weeks sounds fine. Um, in the meantime, most likely it will be the Carthaginian perspective of the First Punic War next week. I only I only have one request on the Dune thing, right? Quick, uh, because the other movie has not come has it's not even filmed yet, and uh, there's a decent chance it won't because it'd be so expensive, you know, and everything. Uh, for the Dune tier ranking, we should just use images from the '84 movie because I they cast. With one or two exceptions, they casted almost every character from the first book. From the first book, I think the big one they didn't was Count Fenring. Yes, um, you're right. He's not in the '84 movie. I, I noticed that when we watched it recently. Oh, Count Fenring and uh, the smuggler, who's not really a major character to be honest, you know. But that's like it. Everybody else, everybody else is cast in the fucking movie. You know, so I was gonna say, like, you know, that'd be a good idea. Shit, man, I should I should reread actually honestly, before we do that, I should reread Dune. It's been ages. Yeah, I haven't re I haven't read it in a while either. Uh my girlfriend still has her copy. She's been working on it for a very long time. Interestingly enough, the exact almost exact point of the movie where it ends is exactly where she was in the book. Okay. So nothing got spoiled for her by watching the movie. She was afraid that the ending was going to be spoiled. But then she got mm. about as lucky as you can possibly get. So, there you go. Alright, everybody. Thank you all very much. And uh, Publius USA says Bush started a 20 year bankrupted Gen Z. He won't ever be popular. Maybe in 90 years. I believe you're correct. I believe this, this like Bush popularity wave is it is probably just a manufactured thing you know that will uh, dissipate uh over time i think it's got i think it's a this is a hard fucking sell guys yeah i think trying to sell bush is kind of like going on tv with like dorky ass parents say remember wait until marriage to have sex okay dad whatever because <laughs> i'm gonna work <laughs> all right everybody good night right. from new orleans uh, good night from Columbus. See you next week, or at least I will. All right, shit. There we go. All right, we're off the air.